Hello, you guys. Roll on in. What's going on, Conscious Crew? It is your host, of course, Conscious TV. And as promised, I'm bringing to you a full black, same gender loving conversation, okay? Um, I know some of you guys have been anticipating this dialogue, and so am I. I have two wonderful guests to help uh, to unpack, expound upon issues around the black community and homophobia and transphobia and even white supremacy and racism uh, within the quote unquote LGBT community. Now that's not Dr. Cleo's choice words. He coined the same gender love. Get into that as well. Dr. Cleo, if you guys have not been following, was just recently a part of a full panel on G Small's channel where he had a large dialogue with a social media personality, Funky Dineva, okay? Things got very interesting and very intimate in terms of the layers that were being peeled back as it relates to Funky Dineva's personal experience as a black same gender loving man. And um, there were things that inspired me in that conversation. There were things that I also wanted to maybe rebut. And there are things that I wanted to just kind of add um, to the points that was being shared across both sides. Now, you guys know I have these conversations all the time. I've been in debates uh, for the past several eight years with everybody from hoteps to black nationalists to black pastors as it relates to sexuality, as it relates to gender identity. And so these dialogues are, you know, I'm not a stranger to these conversations, okay? Now, let me check this stream because I can't even see my stream box. I'm not sure why. Comments. Okay, there we go. Let me let me get it up. What's going on, everybody? What's going on, Jamal? All right. How are you guys doing? Let me put this up on YouTube because StreamYard works pretty slow in terms of its uh, comment section. I can see everything more fluently from the YouTube platform. So let me check that in real quick. And I want you guys to share the stream out, thumbs up this video. Um, if you have any queer people within your family, any same gender loving folk, uh, this is a great conversation for them. Or if there's any cis hetero folk that you would like to be enlightened, um, bring them into this conversation. Text us out, share this on your Instagram, your YouTubes, your, your Facebooks, your Christian mean ghost, your Jack, your Tinder, wherever you pop on social media, okay? I want you to share the stream out. My internet always acting janky, always. Okay. So I'm gonna bring in my cousin. He's also not new to this conversation. He's also participated in dialogue about blackness, about black supremacy, white supremacy, sexuality, spirituality, metaphysics. And when you see him, you gonna know that the genes are very, very, very strong in the bloodline, okay? So let me welcome. Kay, and how are you doing, cuz? <laughs> I'm great, cousin. How are you? <laughs> was that introduction way too, way too fabulous for you? you that, was to be that was a beautiful introduction. I, okay. I, love it. I, I embrace it. I take, I take all of those titles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, the, the bloodline is thick in this family. We, we're here to represent. I tell, I was, well, I was telling y'all, but uh, my subscribers probably don't know, but it. The mixture of hetero and, and, and same gender living in this family is very interesting because we also have a trans cousin, a trans woman who's who's our relative. And so all those intersections within this family just make for a very unique experience. But there seems to be a little bit of everybody in our family. And I really appreciate that diversity. Yeah, for sure. I think we definitely cover the, the entire LGBTQ, same gender loving spectrum within our family. Yes. Well, can you tell a little bit about yourself before I bring in our next guest? Just tell the people who you are, where you come from, and why you're here. Sure. So, uh, social media, I go by KNR Kamari, and, you know, I, I speak on different issues regarding, you know, race, spirituality, um, you know, Black love, Black empowerment, Black affirmation. Um, and then, you know, I've also had conversations regarding you know, issues with that, that impact the black community um, involved in protest with the Black Lives Matter group over the years. And so it's, it's, a, it's a forum and a, and a subject that's very 
near and dear to me. So I, I love engaging in these conversations. And then also talking about kind of the microcosms of, of racism and, and, and some of those things that are, you know, very prevalent within our community as well. Yes, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm looking forward to your contribution to this conversation. Sure, no problem. Okay, but no further ado, I want to introduce our next guest. He's strong, he's fierce, he doesn't back down, and he don't give a good goddamn. He's here to educate and enlighten. I want to welcome Dr. Cleo Monago. Uh, that was an interesting, uh, <laughs> a brand new uh, introduction for me. Don't give a good well, goddamn. original over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, hello, uh, good good afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Cleo. Folks call me Dr. Cleo Monago as well, depending on the circle. And I'm an activist, really. I mean, all of that I do, whether it's the CEO of organization or whether it's doing some scholarly writing or being on television or whatever, the agenda is the advancement of Black people, the healing of Black people, and building unity across the spectrum of who Black people are regarding spirituality, sexuality, gender, expression, and culture. Got it. Okay, wonderful. I, there's something I want to get into after I get after we get a little bit more background. Uh, can you tell the people a little bit about how we intersected, if you remember? I know that you've been around for a long time and the brain not, might not work as well today as it did 20 years ago. But oh, no, the, oh, no, the brain is, is doing quite well. Uh, well, we met because you heard a discussion of sorts between Dr. Umar Johnson, Umar and myself, mm -hmm. and um, wanted to talk to me about it. And I'll have to just say real quick, because those who might go look for that, are call, it's being called a debate, but it was not a debate. It was not a debate, let me make that clear. I asked him to do a debate, but he was afraid to do that, so that didn't happen. But we did have a, tr a truncated interaction when I was hosting Roland Martin's radio show. And you saw it, and that intrigued you, apparently, and you wanted to have more dialogue, and then we did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you and Umar spoken or interacted since? No, no. Would you still? I, 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 I've asked them to. I said, um, you know, you got all these perspectives and all these ideas, and you know, you talk at issues, but let's talk with each other about these same issues because it's one thing to do a monologue, which is a lot, a lot of people like to do. But it's another thing to do a dialogue, particularly with people that look like the people that you claim to be critiquing. Let's let's do this, and he didn't do it. Why do you think that happens a lot of time? Do you think that that's a way of people protecting the narratives that they want to perpetuate? Because I've noticed that as well, that people are like talking about people, but not to people. Well, I'm, I'm almost uncomfortable to talk about that because people are not here to defend themselves. But you ask, so I'm going to do my best to answer that question in ways that don't fully um, mess with people's image. I think that people who are obsessed with sexuality and who make gender demands are personally struggling. And they use and they create platforms based on their struggle and they disassociate from struggle by, by making themselves look like they're an expert on something. But there's a guy who will remain nameless who claims, who can't stop talking about homosexuality. I mean, that's all he talks about. And he claims to be heterosexual. And he, all he talks about is homo, he literally travels the, the, the globe to talk about, to obsess on homosexuality say how bad it is. And I have asked him, well, look, let's discuss this because a lot of stuff you're saying is not, not true. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, because the black community has not had many on a macro level, civil or, um, well, civil or, or, or rational dialogues on this issue, there's a festering of anxiety on this topic that people like that feed into. You know, there's insecure black men who are concerned about their sexuality, also black men who have been raped and haven't had, or molested, and haven't had a proper space to deal with that. There's black women who feel alone or that there's not enough men. And 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 some of that anxiety has them mad at the same gender loving people. And there hasn't been any dialogue beyond their anxiety to let them know that our existence goes beyond their anxiety. And it's not even about their anxiety. We exist whether they're anxious or not. But there hasn't been a lot of rational conversation the black community is afraid of this issue, and I know why, and that, and that might come up in this conversation, but the black yeah. community has circumstantial context in which to be afraid of this issue, and it yeah. is. Yes, absolutely. 
How do you feel about being coined as the homo hotel? Because that's kind of been a running undertone of your reputation that that if there was anything that came close to black power and black liberation uh, <laughs> with the attachment of sexuality, that you would be kind of a perfect hybrid or combination of, of what black same gender love and black dignity looks like all wrapped into one. Like there seems to be, you do, there is a certain respect on your name amongst black nationalists and black supremacists while they still may bat an eye at, at the sexuality aspect. They seem to really honor though, uh, your passion and your strength and your intelligence and your knowledge as it relates to blackness as a whole. How do you feel about the term? Gay hotel. Well, I have to. Well, first of all, no one has ever in my presence called me that. You know, I don't get to hear these these uh, names personally or or in my circle. So I, I I hadn't heard that. Matter of fact, one time as a joke, somebody called me a hotel. I said, No, I'm more like a home hotel. <laughs> you know, so uh, I kind of played around with that. But generally, I don't hear that. I only hear the only people in gossip circles or people who are who have a particularly particular perspective on pro-blackness talk about that but not to me and as a matter of fact inspired by what i think is going on in that earlier when you introduced yourself you went down this list of homophobia transphobia but there's a very important phobia that i do talk about among those that you didn't mention and that's blackophobia mm. there's a lot of blackophobia in the united states and that tendency, which is several centuries old, has trickled down, just like the English language, into black spaces. There's a lot of blackophobic black people, let alone so-called transphobic and so-called homophobic. Mm -hmm. And when you're black and blackophobic, that's particularly ironic and crazy making. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So but it's always forgotten. My point I want to make clear is that blackophobia is always forgotten and not put on the list because people don't see it. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's at the it's at the top of the list, and then everything else within the community is is, is the subsets that that kind of fall in line afterward. We're we're black first. We're we're seeing black first, and then you know, any of those additional identities you know come under attack subsequently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, when y'all say black of Phobia? Are you talking about anti-blackness? I'm talking about. Well, for, first of all, I want to say that my commentary is, a, is only talking about what happens in black spaces. I'm not talking about white folks and what they do at all. We can we can do that if you want to, and let me know when you have crossed over into that. But I'm talking about black people practicing blackophobia. But blackophobia is people who are resistant to addressing issues with the black people or who dismiss it, or who are resistant to deconstructing how white supremacy mythology has impacted the black behavior, black worldview, black experience, and how we deal with each other. And but people who are so mad at black people that they cannot look at racism because they're too mad at black people to address racism, that's who they're mad at. And if you talk about racism or white people, they say, no, you changed the subject. You try to blame everything on them instead of actually looking at what you actually said and respond to what you said. One of the side effects of blackophobia is white accommodationist behavior. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, completely yeah. agree. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, this is going to be a good damn conversation. I can feel it in my spirit already. <laughs> um, I want to kind of go into, especially since you are a civil rights activist, would that be something you would be comfortable titled as? I call myself a black human rights activist. Okay, got it. So can we talk briefly about, if anybody is aware of any of the contributions that same gender loving people have had upon civil rights and civil rights movements? Because a lot of times within black spaces with black people, um, we seem to be non-existent or our community seems to be vastly unaware of our contribution to social equality, social economic equality, to grassroots movements, et cetera. Even Black Lives Matter movement was founded upon by three queer women. Um, 
yourself, Cleo Monago, have led these movements. You've been next to Al Sharpton. You've been within them all. And so how do you guys feel about the lack of representation within our history books? How do you guys feel about young Black youth not being aware? Like as much as Black same gender loving men and women are stigmatized that our community also isn't equally educated about our humanity and about our love for black people, for our own people, our ability to protect and to be invested in the highest interests of our people. I know growing up, I did not hear quote unquote about the contributions of queer people. A lot of who I was informed by about same, and I know I'm sw swapping between same gender loving and queer, um, but I really love the term same gender loving. Um, but I was informed by religion. That was kind of the only attitude that there was about what gay, queer, homeless, trans, anything is, it's an abomination, it's unnatural. Um, in the history books, even when there was Black History Month, I didn't particularly ever was taught specifically about how lesbians are trans women or trans men or black St. 11 men contributed to civil rights. So can you guys speak a little bit to um, to that gap or disparity? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start a little bit. And then I know Dr. Cleo Monago probably has a little bit more, you know, more in-depth um, information regarding that particular subject. But, you know, I think it starts at the top when we talk about black erasure in general. So, you know, very, very little of our contributions are, are taught within this country. You know, when we talk about everything being under this umbrella of white supremacy and perpetuating that white narrative, um, you know, to create that, that white savior complex. So, so within that envelope, there, there's black erasure anyway. Um, but then when we do talk about the accomplishments of, of you know, black individuals within this, within our country, it's, it's, it's very heteronormative, you know, so we don't hear about the, you know, Bayard Rustin and we don't hear about the, the accomplishments of Marsha P. Johnson and, and other individuals that occupy the same gender loving or LGBTQIA space. You know, so I think that's that's where that starts. And because there is there is so much black erasure, it it puts the, the burden of responsibility on us. To, to you know invest in finding out about our history and our own accomplishments. And then um, Dr. Cleo, I think you can probably you know, el elaborate on that. Well, what we do and don't do, and I invite you all to challenge anything I say because I know what I'm saying is true. And sometimes if you challenge me, you get to see the nuances of what I'm saying because I don't really give my opinion often. It's usually just the truth and people don't like the truth. But anyway, much of what we do is determined by what white people have allowed or have created space for. For example, when you think about a well-known, historically relevant, same gender loving or gay identified black person, who comes to mind? Who? I'm asking. He already mentioned what, the one that usually comes to mind. Maybe you can remember who he mentioned. Okay, I'll just say it. Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin, right. Bayard Rustin is always who everybody mentions. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, James Baldwin is the one who was very much involved in black civil rights, who hung out with Malcolm X, who was who hung out with the Black Panthers, including Huey Newton, who was the effeminate, leg-crossing, cigarette-swinging brother, who was hanging out with all the most pro-black people of the time, who, when he died, got a black king's funeral in Harlem because he was a part of the black fabric. But that was not true for Baird Rustin. Baird Rustin was anti black. He spent most of the time with white people. He fought against pro black ideas, including debating Malcolm X. And he spent most of his life and, and most of his personal spaces with, with white folks. And he was the first person to, to imply that racism wasn't an issue, homophobia was the, was the issue. So, but he's the one who comes up all the time because white people like him more than they like James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And so white people, again, are determined who we talk about and who we don't talk about. You mentioned that same gender loving people in history are, are not talked about. We have to understand that we are living in the present day consequence of history. History has been a, a whole lot of stuff. In the, that, in terms of going from far back as when we first got here until now, 
in Harlem, same general loving people used to give picnics that the whole black community came to. Um, a, a dude named Keith Boykin did a survey, um, I think it was in the 90s, assuming when he did a survey on attitudes about homosexuality, that black people were gonna be the most homophobic. And what he found, and, and the Kaiser Family Foundation found when they did surveys in the black community on homosexuality, that black people were one of the most tolerant people of all people about this issue. But we don't know that. We only know whatever white people allowed us to come to the surface as our reality because they control the narrative. But people like Bessie Smith was known as a same gender loving person. Billie Holiday was known to be a same gender loving. Back in the day, Moms Mabley, who some of you may or may not know of, who was a famous comedian, people, I'm talking about black people, I ain't talking about white people, I'm talking about black people knew. Matter of fact, in, in, in close circles, Moms Mabley was, Moms Mabley was known as Mr. Mabley. And if you look at, for example, there was a um, documentary on her, I think Whoopi Goldberg was, was the narrator on HBO, they kind of referenced that. The first, the first mainstream movie to be done about same gender loving people from a black perspective, I bet I'm going to make an arrogant bet that none of you guys have never heard of this. There was a film that starred Pearl Bailey. People, people who are watching can get their Google out now and look for Pearl Bailey and Red Fox. It was a picture called Norman, Is That You? I, I have, have you ever heard of it? No. I didn't think so. And I'm not saying it to be a jerk. I'm saying that because if it don't fit inside of a white narrative, we don't know about it. But black people were the first people to make a mainstream film that affirmed a same gender loving child. The film was called Norman, Is That You? It was made in the 70s. It starred Red Fox as the same gender loving brother's father and Pro Bailey as his mother. And you guys were even born there. So the black community has been the first community to start talking about and acknowledging same gender loving people. There was a person named Sir Lady Java, who you might never heard of as well. Sir Lady Java, which you can tell by the name, is a transgender person. And Sir Lady Java used to be a very famous person in my community. I'm, I'm from Compton, California, what, South Central, you know, straight out of Compton, blah, 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 all that stuff. If you type down, if you type Sir Lady Java right now on Google, she will come up. And she wasn't beaten up or attacked and nothing like that. As a matter of fact, we had the, when they had the Martin Luther King parade down Compton Boulevard, she was on the front floor. This is in a predominantly black community. But the white community and black historical ignorance is one of the issues here. We don't know, we don't know our history. One of the things that your cuz said, which is true in terms of when he first started out, is that we don't really know history generally. So how are we going to know the history of some general loving people? When we don't know our own history, we don't know about Jake, we don't know about George, George Washington Carver, who was saying gender loving. We don't know our African history. We don't know about Kabaka Mwanga. Do you know who Kabaka Mwanga is or was? Uh -uh. Not because you're stupid and not because you're not intelligent, because you're both. You're both in you're very intelligent. But the white framework doesn't provide space or encouragement, particularly the LGBT paradigm, which is a white paradigm, doesn't encourage you as a black person to embrace or learn your history. You know more about Ellen DeGeneres than you do about Kabaka Mwanga because white folks run the narrative. Now we can change that. And I've done a lot of work in my career to unpack all this stuff. A lot of people who know me know who these people are or who've been involved in my work know who these people are. But because I'm too black, there's, a t there's always been tendencies in my career to marginalize me as well because I'm not running behind white folks. And it's not an anti-white decision, it's a black affirming decision. Yeah. Thank you for that history lesson. You gave a lot of folk a lot of nuggets and gems and references there that were really significant. And there's a lot more. I mean, there's a whole lot more from our from our people from Africa that affirms all of us mm -hmm. that we have no idea about. About yeah, yeah. So yeah. you made a. I'm you sorry. Made a, well, no, and I I think Doctor Doctor Cleo made a good point when 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 we're talking about. The, the narratives that have been put out there regarding the black community, especially in, in, in the context of homophobia, we, while completely understanding that there are, you know, real world examples of, you know, individuals being ostracized within the black community, and we, we never want to diminish those experiences. If, if we were to, to perhaps look at the collective, um, you know, there there may be a greater a, a greater sense of acceptance that we are not truly and authentically acknowledging because we allowed the exceptions to run the narrative 
And we allowed that those exceptions to be per perpetuated by, you know, the you know white supremacy and and, and 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 white agendas as well, in order to continue to to vilify and 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 keep the the black community fragmented. I want to get into a little bit of that as we go into this conversation. I want to touch on the personal experiences and kind of how that shapes uh, one's overall perception about a community or a particular group. But before we move on into that, Dr. Cleo, you mentioned that, um, and so the UK in that, we are not educated as a community about ourselves in general. Now, because of the intersection of religion and how powerful of an influence religion has had upon black people. Do you guys think that the history and the knowledge would have trumped the religious perception still around same gender loving people? That if at the same time as a melanated person, you're being taught about the contributions and the humanity of black queer people, but yet you also are entering into Sunday school and Sunday service constantly hearing about how gay this and gay that is an abomination, that people are going to hell, that these people are perverse, that there's demonic influence, etc. Bringing a combination of the actuality of queer people, coupled though with the religious interpretation of same gender loving people, do y'all think that history would have prevailed or that religiosity would have ultimately trumped even if black youth and young black people and just black people in general would have been afforded the 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 knowledge about same gender loving contribution to their community no first of all first of all the bible doesn't mention same gender loving people the most common the most common reference to same gender loving people that a lot of people use is Sodom and Gomorrah and Sodom and Gomorrah is not about same gender loving people right as a matter of fact, it highlights rape. It highlights all kinds of horrible things, um, but people misinterpret it or pimp it for their own reasons and, and change what it means. One of the other lines, and I can't quote it verbatim right now, but you've heard it before, thou shall not lay with the man as they, as they do with the woman. And when somebody says this to me, I say, well, you, okay, I got that covered, but I lay with a man, I'm laying with a man as I would with a man, not with a woman. So I'm not doing what you're saying. So, okay, we can move, we can move past that. I'm laying with a man as I would with a man. So that don't count here. I'm not thinking about a woman when I'm laying with a man. <laughs> so we're covered, we're clear. So, but, but again, even the religion, the King James Version, if you will, that black people were indoctrinated in is a result of white supremacy mythology and slavery. Yeah. And it works on black people. Yeah, and, and it was used specifically to, to you know, for for the purposes of control. You know, again, exalting exalting the white savior complex, mm -hmm. um, and then putting us in a sub, in a subordinate position mm -hmm. um, by you know by use of violence, rape, humiliation, degradation. You know, all all of these things, and and using the Bible. You know, to to justify and excuse that the barbaric behavior, you know, and and because of that trauma, you know, the black the black community subsequently was hurt and traumatized by it, and mm -hmm. yeah, and and because of that, you know, that's that's when a, a, all of the 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 complexities and and and, and the the nuanced <laughs> layers of, of self hatred, you know, manifest within our community as well. Yeah. See, once, once we, and when we are allowed opportunities to deconstruct the myth of white supremacy and its deep and, and, and uh oh. Is he freezing on your end too, Kayan? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so you're back for a moment. Am I here? Yeah, you're here now. Okay. okay, once we and when we are given or take the opportunity to deconstruct the omnipresent, multi level impact of the myth of white supremacy and white supremacy patriarchy, 
on the black psyche and culture and actually learn to connect the dots and separate that from who we are culturally and individually. And when it comes to gender and everything else, we'll be a more healed, more sane people. Because we really, what I always say, and you might have heard me say this before, is that black people are in a white supremacy mythological trauma trance. We are in a trance. We are not fully present. We are not clear. We are confused. We are fragmented. We are confused on, on with spiritually, gender, masculinity, feminine, all the whole thing. There's a lot of confusion because our lives take place on side on side of the slaughter of our psyche as and our self-concept as a people. And you brought in religion. I mean, without going into that whole thing, is a fact that Africans who practice African spirituality were either murdered or tortured. Oh, it, absolutely. And that was done to make sure that black people were easier to brainwash. And back in the day when we weren't allowed to read, when it was literally deadly to be caught with a book, we were it was all right to have the Bible with the fake white Jesus in it. Mm -hmm. So black people have learned to find something good about chitlins, you know, something good about weeds, which greens used to be, something good about trash like religion because it was forced on us and it's what we had to have or die or be miserable or tortured. And now because we don't know our history and where it came from in terms of how it was introduced to us and how our own spirituality was, was purged from us, we don't know about that experience. So people are being born now seeing crazy religion and hypocritical stuff and don't know that it's really from a white framework. All they see is black people doing it and they don't, don't know their history. So they think it's black church, black this, black that. But the whole thing, including the architecture of how to be anti-homosexual, came from white folks. I don't know if you ever heard of Anita Bryant. Either. Yes. Okay. Well, Anita, Anita Bryant, Jerry Falwell, and there were some others who were the architects of the anti-homosexual movement in this country who started the whole thing. It wasn't black people or black men who started the anti-homosexual movement. But black people, unfortunately, to try to accommodate their oppressor, always have to master what's thrown at us. That's where soul food came from, the mastery of cooking crap and your job and religion and, how, and, and it becoming black religion and gospel is the mastery of making crap beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 and one thing I always say is, you know, if, if white people do anything well, it is, you know, cre creating illusions. It is it's the, it's the mastery of, um, you know, the psychological mind fuck. It, you know, to be to be blunt about it, because they've been doing this for centuries. It, it didn't just pop up. They, they've been doing this for centuries. And and to Dr. Cleo's point, you know, with them using, you know, religion. Okay. I'm sorry. OK, you guys are back. Oh, oh I didn't know you left. <laughs> um, you know, they, they used re religion to, you know, to to degrade us and, and, and to to make us subservient. But then we also talk about the, the narratives that they perpetuate in order to also keep us subservient and docile. Um, you know, Dr. Cleo made a great point and they, they intentionally exalt certain individuals within the gay community because it helps to perpetuate the, the, the narrative of the, the good subservient black. You know, when you have Martin Luther King during the civil rights movement and you have Malcolm X during the, the civil rights movement, they hated them both, <laughs> you know, the, the, the they, they, they didn't love Martin Luther King at, at, at the time and they weren't rallying behind him. But after they assassinated him, then, then his image gets exalted because what is it that they were that they wanted to instill within the black community? This very peaceful, docile existence. You know, if you're going to protest, protest peacefully, nonviolently, like Dr. King said, you know, it, 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 it all it, it all serves to perpetuate their sense of comfort. They don't want us to disrupt the narrative. They don't want us to make them uncomfortable. So it, it, every, everything that they've been doing in this system has been very intentional, very methodical throughout yep. the centuries. Yep. And even when, we, even when they murder us and slaughter us like Dylan Roof did, there was a forgiving campaign that came out in the press the next day. About it was on the front page of the Atlanta Journal. Every place it was forgiving because of the whisper about forgiving him that came out. The dude that was in Central Park recently, who, who could have got murdered because the white woman called the called oh, the cops on him. He, he forgave her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 
and they and they blow that up because they want us to, st to stay in a mind f u c k and constantly allowing them to do horrible stuff. But one thing I want us to do before it's too late because I know there's some very at the risk of offending people, gay entrenched folks who are who are thinking in anti-black, blackophobic ways and saying we blame everything on the white man. I'm talking about black people. I'm talking about white folks. We blame it on a white man. We blame everything on a white man. We need to talk about how much black people hate homosexuals and how and how much black men are killing homosexuals. That narrative is out there somewhere, and it, and it's attempting to make this irrelevant. So I think we should do a synthesis of how that's relevant. What we've been saying, because I think it's very relevant to this current phenomenon of young people and older people, including Deneva, who was saying stuff like, "I'm more comfortable with white folks," because Deneva said this. Well, right. Quentin, I'm going to call him Quentin. Quentin said, I'm more comfortable with white folks than I am with black folks. And he said this in the wake of the murder of, of, of tons of black men. Some who've become famous, some who, are, who only are known on, lo on the local level who didn't become famous and whose numbers goes up in the hundreds. Um, but, that, but still want to call these men men of privilege, if you will, and talk about the victimy of trans people and how bad black people, particularly so-called straight appearing black men are, we need to um, find a way to synthesize this and have a conversation about this because this is meaningful for people right now. So I want to get into that. Um, there were parts of your dialogue with Dineva that was definitely triggering for me as well because obviously um, as a same gender loving male, my aesthetic appeals and offends maybe um, a certain populate a certain as a certain portion of our population that maybe K and yourself don't have to intersect with. And so, in that way, I was able to relate to Funky Dineva. Now, when Funky Dineva when Funky Dineva began to talk about being safer in white spaces, I mean, as horrendous and wicked and demented we know that white consciousness is, and there's no way to really scoot around that, that's completely just fact. History bears that out, that there's something deeply wrong with the psyche of Caucasian people. But set that aside, there also is a, there's a dysmorphia and, and, and even dementia that has developed within the black community. And we know that a lot of that is due to black men struggling to self-actualize in a white patriarchal system. And so a lot of that gets turned inward and then gets, and then becomes manifested as domestic violence upon black women. It becomes manifested as transphobia, homophobia, because black men are after a a, a sense of self and a sense of power. And sometimes because the only example of power has been massa, a lot of times they are not understanding that what they want is power and domination and not actual um, equality and self-actualization. When it comes to men like myself, um, like Funky Dineva, my experiences of homophobia have been overwhelmingly more consistent um, in black male spaces than white male spaces. And I've been afforded to kind of have an immigrational experience in life. I come from a very mixed race family. I've had the privilege of attending black and white schools. I have been afforded to spend a lot of time with Caucasian people growing up and even now and black people. And there are just certain things that just simply are, despite a lot of the historical context, despite a lot of the other things that we mentioned here that contribute to the issue that are just what they are when certain types of people are in certain types of spaces. Sort of like when you talk about, if we were to talk about women dressing promiscuously are, are being scantily dressed, that in certain, in certain areas, you're more in danger. That's just fact. Then in other areas of New York, if you are in around a certain demographic of people, you are probably more in danger of sexual assault and rape than in other aspects of the community. And I'm going to, because I see you frowning it up, Dr. Cleo. I'm trying to hey, listen. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I'm, I'm trying to hear this. <laughs> um, so prime example, um, one of the things that I've noticed 
because I know that you and fucking I even have brought up the whole like I think you asked him why do you think that a white person would be more inclined to hire I think a black effeminate male more than a I guess mass presenting. Well, real quickly, because I want to hear what you have to say. What I said was, and this is based on more than one story that's not a distant story, but somebody I know personally. Um, when so they did when they first walked in the door, they were seen as a black male, period. And there was distance, and there was just, you know what happens at a regular interview where people are just distant because they don't know who you are and they don't want to show any favoritism, or whatever. When they found out by going through his resume that he worked in a gay center and assumed he was gay, they they, they had a sigh of relief, and they weren't necessarily homosexuals themselves. They had a sigh of relief, like, okay, we can play with this person, we can relax with this person because they're less of a threat. So mm -hmm. That's what I, that's that's what I shared with, with yeah. Okay. With and, and I will add to that, just from an HR perspective, the the data supports that as well. Uh, the, most most black men in positions of authority have been gay men, and and statistically speaking. It's, it, it's probably because on a psychological level, they they feel they feel as if gay men are less less of a threat versus a heterosexual black man. So so even even in, in, in corporate settings, you know, when we when we look at recruiting statistics, you know, men who have who have asserted to leadership roles within organizations who happen to be black typically are homosexual men. Yeah. Well, I think it's I think it's very clear at this point that certainly corporate America's business model is definitely a white patriarchal one, which is why our hair is policed, our texture is policed, our mannerisms are policed in those spaces because they're so heavily dominated by whatever conceptualization white supremacy comes up with as it relates to itself and blackness. But when it comes to because I want to phrase this real correctly, so I'm going to take my time talking. Um, I understand. So with white people, it's interesting because some people share an attitude that all white people are racist. Some people would beg to differ. Um, I've even noticed like that growing up and even now, if I go into a white space, ask who I am and all my individuality, et cetera, that I'm more likely to be critiqued very differently than I would in a black space, such as I would be considered edgy, cool, um, fashionable. There could There's a lot more availability of positive interpretation of who I am. Being somebody who also lives still in an urban neighborhood that is predominantly around black people there's a narrow mindedness in terms of interpretation. Gay, 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 gay. Now what's interesting that I kind of go into my background a little bit because I've been raised kind of within a blended family situation. Um, when I was growing up, I liked a lot of things that were different. I liked heavy metal music. I liked punk rock. I was into a lot of the gothic culture, um, having long hair. I was into things that amongst my my urban peers were considered white and or gay. Um, before I even understood myself to be gay, I never attributed the things that I liked, including having long hair, including all of these different things to be about sexuality. But that was the interpretation of the environment around me, that everything that made me different as a black man was just always kind of lumped into uh, gay, 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 gay. But I noticed that amongst my white peers, that wasn't that wasn't always like gayness didn't even come into play. I think that a lot of times black queer men feel safer in white spaces because white patriarch isn't as hyper in its masculinity as it is within black spaces. White people have a lot more nuance in terms of how they allow other white men to self-actualize, which is why you see a array of, of, of white men. You have the jock, you have the prep, you have the nerd, you have the gothic white kid, you have the punk. There's so many different uh, 
there's so much allowed for white men. And obviously that would be the case because white men make up the rules. Of course they get to fully stuff actualize. Yeah, exactly. You know, so we aren't, but we as black people aren't afforded that. And because we aren't afforded that, sometimes we protect ourselves against that, which is different, interpreting it as a threat or abnormal because it doesn't fit what black really is. So when <laughs> Funky Daniva was saying, hey, I feel safer emotionally and physically, um, that's honestly not even a unique sentiment. That's the sentiment of plenty of black, gay, especially black, young, gay, black, young, same gender loving men right. in this world. Most of us, let me tell you, I have friends right now who grocery shop on the white side of town. I have trans, trans black women as friends who will get their gas pumped on the white side of town because they're so afraid of what each encounter with a black man would be for them. I know same gender loving black people who have been traumatized by the way that homophobia is projected uh, in terms of that violence physically, that violence emotionally, that violence mentally, that violence uh, spiritually. And what's interesting to me is that when we talk about the black same gender loving community, we're talking about a community that is wounded out of the jump because you're already conditioned to be anti same gender loving yourself, even as a same gender loving person. And then you're raised in a community that reinforces and creates a barrier around you being able to accept yourself and being able to embrace yourself. And then you have black cis hetero men protecting their masculinity by trying to beat you into masculinity or beat the femininity out of you. And so there's a rewounding and a rewounding and a rewounding and a rewounding. And I don't want to put too much emphasis on just physical violence, but upon also the emotional violence that black same gender loving men and women and black trans women experience from cis hetero men and women in their families, in their communities, in their school systems, um, there's been a plethora of social media videos that have went viral where black same gender loving men were sitting at the park downtown minding their business and other black men more so we would assume cis hetero black men come over oh get your gay ass up y'all niggas can't be here literally like pissing on the territory and these black same gender loving men, get up and move. Now, had that been to me, the only thing I would have moved was my hand into my Gucci bag where my pistol was. And then we would have saw who would have been moving. But these black men were intimidated out of their space. There was another video that recently went viral of a black same gender loving man walking down the street minding his business. And another black man comes out of nowhere and just starts punching him and hurling faggot this and faggot that. And so this fear that a lot of black same gender loving and trans people feel it's not an assumption it's not a conclusion this is a reality and i think that there is something to be said about mass presenting black queer men being shielded being shielded maybe or even their perception being blurred because as fucking aniva said as much as i may be like kn and maybe like Cleo, that we are alike in some ways, we're also totally different. And I, I, and I am sure that there are things in my everyday life that I have to go through because I present this way that you, KN, and you, Dr. Cleo, don't get to experience on a daily basis because y'all are more passable or blendable. But I'm gonna let y'all speak to some of that before we well, go. You said a whole- I know, I know. <laughs> And uh, it covered all kinds of places. And I think that going forward, it'd be helpful to ask some specific questions regarding the different things that concern you so I can make sense. Because I'm, I'm going to bring all that together and I don't know if I'm going to do a good job because there's so much of it. Uh, because And it was all important. But I do remember wanting to tell you that, first of all, you don't know how white people feel about you. You know how they behave around you and how they act around you. You don't know how they feel around you. For example, and there's a whole lot of examples I can give, but for example, a lot of white people who reported they, that they were going to vote against Trump publicly because they didn't want to be seen as racist voted for Trump. And the only reason that we found out that, that over half the people that supported him were women was because of statistics, not based on what they verbally reported. So 
well, you don't know how they feel. And white people are very, very self-conscious about how they feel. And they do a lot of strategic stuff around how they are seen and how they operate in public. And so you don't know how they feel. And they could be racist as hell. And they would not, and they're not gonna actually tell you that. So I just wanna say that first. The other thing that, um, so my point is that don't be assuming they like you because they're all in your face. I know. That they respect you because they're all in your face. The other thing that I said to, to Quentin that I think is important and I'm going to reiterate it here based on what you last said about whatever, what, what Kayan goes through and what Clill goes through. I can't speak to what Kayan goes through because Kayan and I are not um, prototypically the same in terms of our physical, um, how we show up physically. And there's differences even there in terms of how people treat people. But what bothers me about people with your perspective is no one asks. Everybody's so busy. Be, everybody's so busy being the most oppressed. Nobody asks what so-called masculine presenting people go through. They see the bodies piling up, you know, Michael Brown, George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo. We can go on and on and on. They see the bodies piling up all the time in prison and in mortuaries. Men who, who typically look like me, I mean, the murder rate is off the chain in terms of who's getting the kill the most in this country by a long shot. It's, the evidence is there. But nobody ever asked anything about the terror that likely led Trayvon to trying to defend his life when he's being tracked by by George Rivers Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. So, so feminine people are, are are acting as if they have all the real estate on terror and pain and fear, and and, and and you don't. Number one. Number two, the black community, and I've lived in black communities all over the country, including right now. Trans people, including feminine men, are ex it's very rare that there's a, that there's a physical assault. And a physical attack. It occurs, yes. It's like it occurs among white people. I used to work at a place that I helped find in Los Angeles called the Los Angeles Youth Network. The Los Angeles Youth Network was a shelter for runaway children who had been put out of their homes or who were struggling around their sexuality. The majority of them were homosexual children. They were white, they were Asian, they were black, they were Latino, and they had they all had in common being oppressed by their own people for being what they are. See, one, one of the powers of the white gay community is that it's created the mirage of white homosexual acceptance. First of all, if you look at the people that, that fought most against same-sex marriage, it was white people. The mm -hmm. first people who were willing to go to jail, like you might have heard about that case in Texas where this couple, this same-sex couple went to get a, get a cake made and the cake and the and the and the cake maker said, "No, I'm not making no cake for no two pong, a white woman." And she was willing to go to jail because it's, it's against the law now to discriminate against homosexuals. So I'm not saying, like some of your listeners might think, I'm saying that black people don't have no issues. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying for a minute that there's not black people who don't practice what I call violent homophobia. I'm not saying that. At all, because I know that's I would be crazy for saying something like that. What I am saying, which a lot of LGBT ears don't say, is that those men who attack you or who have something to say about you are not necessarily heterosexual men. From the ages of 15 to about mid 40s, my best friend was a person that I met at 14 who was a male who, by the time they became 21, became a trans transgender female. And I and I stuck with them like glue because I loved them. They were my friend. But all I heard all the time, and it was not from heterosexual men, it was from homosexual. Why are you hanging out with them? What's wrong with you? How, how could you how could you be around that? And call and and it was same gender loving or what I'm calling because of consciousness, gay identified men who were being defiling and dismissive and discriminatory. And they would tell you themselves, this transgender friend, the people that tortured them the most are other homosexuals. Right. And we don't know, I'm gonna close with this, because I can't remember everything you said, but we don't know what the sexuality is of these people who have been killed by the cops. We assume that they're heterosexual. Nice. We don't know what the sexuality is of the people who, who, who are killing transgender people. We're making a lot of assumptions. And those assumptions in too many cases are blackophobic, black melophobic, masculine presenting melophobic, and they're based on mythology and myths. Femophobia is a problem in the United States of America, and, and, and the problem is all over the, it's all across the spectrum. And, I, and, and as I said earlier in this conversation, 
which we haven't gotten to yet, even though you cover some of it brilliantly, frankly, in, in the middle of the, or the beginning of your rant, black men are terrorized and fighting in a patriarchal model country. That's all they know is this country's model of what a man's supposed to be to achieve that destructive level of manhood that white people have taught them at the risk of the safety of feminine people, regardless of whether they're male or female, and each other. Because what people don't want to talk about either, either, which is part of the whole acting out, is that black men are killing each other too and attacking each other too, regardless of gender expression. Now, of course, not everybody in the black male community is doing these things. But I'm trying to make to you is that these attacks that are happening at the hands of black men are not just the real estate of feminine people. It's, it's black men are acting unresolved, unhealed, tortured black men, insecure black men, which you kind of spoke to earlier in your in your rant, are are suffering. And, 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 and some of that behavior comes out as violence and, and feminine men are not getting the most of it. That's not true. You, we talked at 18 trans people who we know of who were murdered. Some of those people, we don't even know who murdered them and over a thousand black men. And over over five hundred women. I want to just make a. Is that a clear? Okay, I just. But see, the 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 issue is though is that we're not just talking about murder. Like we're just talking about the bullying, and we're also talking about the psychological damage that black men and eleven people endure too. And to be honest, even with the viral video, even with the videos that have gone viral, where black queer men and women are being assaulted, are being bullied, are being uh, intimidated out of spaces. Those, a, a, a lot of times we don't even report upon the hate crimes committed against us. So even the numbers are very skewed in terms of what the data, what the data actually reveals and that's about. Across the board. And that's true across the board. I used to be a policeman. Right. And that's true across the board. A lot of black crimes are underreported. A lot mm -hmm. of them. Right. <clears throat> a lot of domestic violence of of, of, from from women against men is underreported mm -hmm. because it's humiliating. Washington, D.C. is the only place in this country that has a shelter for men who have been the victims of domestic violence. So there's a lot of violent stuff in, in communities that's, that, that's underreported. That's, that don't belong to, to heterosexual, excuse me, I know. people either. But it's only relevant to the conversation about what we're talking about because I would encourage everybody to start reporting everything so that we can have an accurate database as it relates to these things so that when we come to the conversation we don't have to deal with vague data or talk about what's not being I, I feel like anybody being assaulted being killed being murdered being treated in any kind of way that's illegal and damaging to you like for all communities to lead the race upon doing what needs to be done so that we can we can have more of an objective means in terms of analyzing this and interpreting this and getting to the bottom of it i know that you mentioned behavior as well and you said that white people don't assume what white people feel for me i don't for for me and this one i speak for me i only give a damn about behavior i actually don't care what's in your heart i don't care what your personal feelings are what i care about is my personal safety and being able to enter and exit a space um okay i'm perfectly okay with sitting next to people who believe i see the interesting thing about because there's an attitude amongst cis hetero folk that black that same gender loving people want want acceptance. We've we've been conditioned to actually not look for that and, and, and are perfectly have made ourselves for the most part okay with not being accepted. We don't even know really what that is to be accepted because anytime that you came out of the closet or anytime that your sexuality became or your gender identity became known. Okay, there was a bunch of rhetoric within the family. There was a bunch of rhetoric and confusion and a lot and a lot of the chess pieces started to move. Certain people who messed with you before they knew don't mess with you. There's a whole collapse that happens a lot of times for a lot of black queer people, especially those who weren't that it would it would have been surprising to know that you in fact are bisexual for the more mass presenting black and to see you, you have you really have absolutely, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you already said things that makes what I'm saying true. You don't know what my experience is. 
Well, I'm not saying that I do. I'm just speaking. No, 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 what you're assuming or what, what, so, what some of Deneva's followers based on the mail has been sent to me. And I was assuming that I'm just waltzing through life as this masculine presented man. man you know, the that's, body. Not, that's not my assumption because I, I had acknowledged earlier, I had acknowledged earlier that yes, we are alike, but I'm going to stick by my guns that we are not the same, though we are alike. Yes, I am obviously as we can't even talk about homophobia without understanding that everybody who falls within that category obviously has been impacted and experienced and intersected with homophobia from the most mass presenting to the most effeminate. Like we are very aware of that, but also as I think Kenya mentioned, there is a hierarchy system too that exists and there is privileges even within a marginalized oppressed group. There is that mass presenting. I have watched it. Like the, the thing about me is that like, I know what it's like to be in your shoes because I can blend if no, I tie it. No, I, I know I know what you're gonna say. I don't, but but I can I I have been I wasn't always this. I didn't always present this way. I presented as Kayan. I presented as a Cleo Monago. I've had the luxury of actually walking in both shoes, but I'm not sure that so-called mass presenting black men can understand what it actually feels like to be me because not a I lot of I, I didn't say I did it. I want to be clear. I, 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 I'm just making the point. I say, I'm saying this I'm saying there's a bunch of assumptions being made about me. I'm not talking about I'm not putting any kind of values on what you are or are not experiencing. I'm talking about me. Because well, I mean there's a lot of assumptions being made and they're like wrong as hell. Most it, ain't no, it ain't no assumptions. I, I I accept that you have had your fair share of homophobia and experiencing that. I mean, I that would be very easy to believe because you are a open, same gender loving man. And you and call me queer. Thank you so much. Well, here, <laughs> but, but, well here, 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 here's the thing here for me when, when we're talking about this particular piece of the conversation. No, no one, no one holds, there, there's no hierarchy on trauma. So I, I think you know when we're we're having this particular piece of the conversation, whether we're talking about individuals who present, you know, more masculine than feminine, or or vice versa, or wherever they sit on the spectrum, everyone's experiencing trauma to some extent, and 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 that trauma, your trauma, you know, Davion is no greater than Dr. Cleo Monago's trauma, trauma, and Dr. Cleo's trauma is no no greater than. But can we be clear about? I said there's a. I said that we are having different experience. I said exactly. I rank it as a, one over the other. It's just simply yes, you did. Exactly. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. No, I did not. Yes, did. Yeah, I think I think yeah, if, well, if, I did, if I did, I'm making it clear now that I'm talking about difference. Uh, exactly. I think that's I think that's the common theme here that needs to be that needs to be highlighted. Well, because we're individuals and we occupy, you know, individuality and, and we occupy an infinite space, we all show up very differently. And so all of our experiences are going to be very different. Um, and, and that doesn't negate that, you know, my trauma is greater than, you know, anyone else's trauma just because of how Ken chooses to show up in the world and how Davion chooses to show up in the world and Dr. Cleo. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, that may be one of those pieces that, that may have been lost in translation, whether it was, you know, with the conversation with Quentin or Funky Dineva. And I think maybe some of the individuals that are that were watching these these various podcasts, you know, feeling like Dr. Dr. Cleo or, or interpreting his message one way. And, and, you know, and vice versa on your end as well, um, cuz, you know, I, I, I think, you know, just for our, you know, community in general, no one, no one's getting a, a gold statue on who's more traumatized. <laughs> well, there's, well, there's people definitely going for the or for the reward. Uh, yeah, definitely. And and um, I just want to say real quickly that I never ever once said, and I'm not saying this to you, that your oppression is not real. And, and everything that you said about femophobia, I, I coined the term femophobia as an undergraduate at Long Beach State University. So I've been concerned about femophobia forever and people being mistreated for, be, for being feminine, obviously, particularly males, most of my life. A lot of people don't know that. They make a lot of sense about me because of my low voice and my presentation, some of which I can't, which I can't control completely. But um, I have not, I have defended feminine people 
to the height for for decades. So I am not denying, including my trans friend, who people, mostly homosexual people, tried to bully me for even knowing and caring about as much as I do and did. But I'm, what I'm saying, to be clear here, is that there's assumptions being made about what I go through as a so-called masculine presenting person that people don't know what the hell they're talking about. And they will never even engage the possibility of getting beyond their assumptions. In, and I always should give them a hint, say, in the wake of the, the likes of all these murders of, of so-called masculine presenting men, people still looking for this alleged privilege. And like I said to Quentin, I don't know nothing about safety and not feeling terrorized and, and feeling like I have some kind of protection. I don't know what that's like. And a lot of the behavior that black men are acting out, including unfortunately on each other, on feminine people or people who they can physically control because of attitude or size, they're acting out because they feel so out of control. For example, um, a little bit after apartheid collapsed or allegedly collapsed, in Azania, which white folks got us calling South Africa, there was a there was a, a rise in domestic violence and violence toward ch children among the black men, because the black male, the African, they call themselves Africans, they don't call themselves black over there. So I want to make that clear. But among the Azanian, Dr. Among, Frozen again? Oh, I can I can hear him. I done told Doctor about that Boost Mobile, that Boost Mobile connection. It, it's 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 sorry. It's, I don't, I don't it's, use it's, yeah. I, I can. Did you hear me, Kaya? Everything I, I said. Did. Okay, but my point is, you over there with that, with that, with that feminine, uh, uh, what you call it, a uh, uh, internet thing. Anyway. Oh my god! I'm messing with you. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I'm, no, what I'm really serious about is that the black men have been so humiliated. So dehumanized, so castrated, so counter patriarchal in terms of their treatment, with no therapy, like a lot of black people have not had to this very day in terms of since slavery, with no type of therapeutic process for healing and repair. So people are acting out on each other. And that's what's happening among black people. And we need to stop trying to win, whether it's inadvertent or intently, the oppression contest and take a look at what we have all gone through and learn about our history. Because one of the wonderful things about African history is that it's very inclusive. If you talk, if you knew about the, Do, the Dogon and the Dagara community of Burkina Faso and even the people of Kemet and Agnaten and in and, and the I mean, we have always been a people historically going back in the ancient times that didn't even trip off of differences. You, you know, how's your day? I mean, there's exceptions to everything. So I want to make that clear. But right now, I can show you video right now in 2000, from 2019 when I was in Ghana of black men walking the streets hand in hand, arm in arm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the middle of the day, everybody looking and being very affectionate. I can show you images of black men on each other's laps. At the at the pyramids, in front nobody cares. Nobody nobody's paying them no mind because it's a part of the African cultural norms. We're acting out over here because of white folks. You may or may not know about what happened to Joan of Arc. You may not may or may not know about the insurrection against homosexuality in Britain and all the burnings at the stake and all that kind of stuff. Africans don't have that kind of history. As a matter of fact, in Africa. And this is an absolute fact, and I invite all your listeners to check to do their own research, like I said about Kabaka Mwanga and, and the other stuff in the past, and late Sir Lady Java. Every place that's anti-homosexual in Africa is using colonial legislation and rules yeah. that are still in place. As a matter of fact, in Botswana, look it up, people who are watching this. In Botswana, I think it was about two years ago now. They have recently purged all of the colonial rules out of their system, including against homosexuality. And you go read it on Google. In Botswana, it's illegal to be anti-homosexual because it was part of what they did to get rid of colonial governance of their country. And we don't know nothing about that here. All we know about is the so-called homophobia over in Uganda, not realizing that a guy named Scott Lively, look that up, people who are watching, Scott Lively, a white man from the Midwest, went to Uganda 
and planted all that anti-homosexual behavior over there, including the kill the gays deal. Yeah, I think I think Dr. Clear makes a really good point. When, when we talk about <laughs> any of these anti-rhetorics, whether we're talking about you know anti-LGBTQ, anti-Black, and and the list goes on and on. The the, the, the seed that <laughs> the, the 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 seed of these items all start with white supremacy. The the ideology behind white supremacy and 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 them being the ones to push this these narratives. You know, when we talk about, you know, the Europeans, you know, coming over and, and, and colonizing the, the world and, and in that colonization, you know, planting to the seeds of all of these, you know, all, all of these behaviors and all of these ideas that tear down, you know, various communities, whether it's, you know, black communities, you know, any community of color and any other marginalized community. Um, they, these were white Europeans that, that pushed these narratives and these ideas. So it is, a, it's, it's a very interesting paradigm to then find safety in the very spaces that created, <laughs> you know, the, these, these very divisive, very yeah, wow. violent um, narratives that we, you know, that, that, that we have to navigate today. Name some well-known same gender loving people who likely identify as gay who are black. Name name the one. I'm not talking about people who are known in certain circles, even relatively high profile circle. Name the well-known, relatively famous black gay identified people in the in the media. Such as like Don Lemon and Robin Roberts. Don right? Lemon, Robin Roberts. Keep going. Uh, Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes. Keep going. We, Lee we, Daniels. And there's more. RuPaul. Now, what do they all have in common? I, Be quiet, Kay. <laughs> what, what do they all have in common? <sighs> Tell your cousin answer that question. What, what do they all have in common? See, white yeah. people don't do coincidences. There's no such thing as an accidental pattern. It was right. It's not an accident. Mm -hmm. What do they have in common? Yeah, you're asking me, or you're asking. I'm asking, I'm asking your cousin because you already know. I saw care about your eyeballs. You already know. I want to find your cousin though. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, some of those what like they all have non-black partners. They all have white partners. All of them. Mm -hmm. And the people on the list that we forgot about all have white partners. That's because white people are are the one controlling the narrative and bringing people into center stage who they're comfortable with, who literally love them, and who are not going to be a threat to their supremacy because they are making love to that supremacy on a daily basis on the, on, the, on their personal time. Again, there's no such thing as a accidental pattern. There are such things as same gender loving people who, who like who are black that love somebody black. They exist on planet Earth, but they don't make it. To, they don't make it to the popular stage because white people are the gatekeepers. And a lot of our mentality around all this stuff is because of our reaction to a white narrative or a white trauma impact phenomena. Well, I will give credit to the the younger community though. I think they are they're they're helping to you know, shake up and dismantle a lot of those narratives, you know. Oh, who? who? I, 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 hey, I, I'm just, I, I don't see it. The, the, the young actor from Queen Sugar, he came out with his, his partner, the, the, the young man, Justice. So you have two young black men who are, you know, openly loving one another. Um, I mean, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot to, <laughs> a whole lot to draw from. I'm laughing because anything could happen in a moment because white people don't control, don't control every, every minuscule moment of planet Earth. There are black people in, on Earth, like I said, who, who, who like each other. But that dude is not going to become well-known and famous beyond that moment of coming out. We haven't heard about it much since. We know about it, and you probably you know about it, but it's not part of popular, popular culture discussion or news. Mm -hmm. Don Lemon is, and these other people running around behind white folks are. 
But yes, if you get your microscope out, you'll find <laughs> even among even among heterosexual people, a lot of people don't know that that woman who starred in Scandal, what's her name? Mary Washington. Is married to a fine brother. They don't know that. Mm -hmm. they don't, you don't hear about black on black love, regardless of sexuality in popular culture, because they don't want black and black love to actually be something that is that's inspired to do in this culture, because that means that we might not be loyal to whiteness. We'll be loyal to blackness, and they're trying to interrupt that. And frankly, the LGBTQ paradigm, with all of this alleged acceptance of the likes of you, they are accepting anybody who seems to be co-signing their politic. But you don't go into that phenomena affirming black people, which is why you know more about the existence of Bayard Rustin than a man who was actually out of the closet, who was actually on the front lines against racism, which was James Baldwin. What's his name? Bear Russell was not out of the closet. He was not an out activist in his day. He was not. He was not pro-black and he was not out. But you would think he was the, all of that, given how much his name comes up in gay circles, right. more than James Baldwin, who indeed was out. Yeah. But racism keeps running the show. And until we stop letting that happen or to, or becoming become self-evaluative of how much we're feeding into it, it's going to continue to do its damage. Again, what you go to as a person who is what we used to call androgynous and who, who has feminine presentation, I'm not denying that. I'm not, I know that happens. I've seen it with my own eyes. But I didn't see it. What I don't agree with at all is that that's heterosexual real estate. I know same gender loving black men who can't stand transgender people and don't, and, and 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 call feminine people faggots. If you, I've literally for presentations went on Adam for Adam and um, Jacked and these other things and recorded and wrote and, and took pictures of their ads. They talk about feminine people like dog. These are all these are all people chasing dick. These are all homosexuals. No faggots. I have these. I have these ads. I've actually collected them. From these ads, these are homosexual men saying no faggots, no femmes. If you a sissy, don't fucking talk to me. Those aren't heterosexual people. They're not. Even, they're nowhere near Jack. They're nowhere near Adam for Adam. So we need to stop the BS about talking about what all these heterosexual men do when we don't need it, when we don't know what the sexuality people of the abuse of people are these people that was in the park they weren't having sex before they harassed these people you don't know what they what they are and like i told quentin there's a lot of destructive disassociative behavior in our community where people disassociate through violence or through abuse because they don't want no association with that so they'll act like they don't like it and they'll be over the top of their abuse to make sure that they fool you real well, that I'm not like that. Yeah. And, well, and, we, and we don't ever want to get into the practice of, you know, exalting exceptions as the norm. That's right. Well, which, which happens a lot. Well, we're doing that a lot in this conversation, actually. But oh, really? I want to speak, huh? huh? How? When? I'm going to get to it. But I want to kind of piggyback a little bit because y'all said a lot. Now, I need to say a little bit more. Um, technically, can we say that the homophobes and transphobes who are who have assaulted and murdered trans and queer black men, can we say for sure that they're straight? No, but it's a reasonable assumption because a lot of these people are married, are baby fathers, Baby mamas are were currently were currently in relationships, and they present as mask as heterosexual, etc. Now, my 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 my, my <laughs> issue is hold on, hold on, wait. But my, my issue is <clears throat> you can be like we can skew the narrative by saying, well, not all transphobes and not all homophobes can be assumed to be straight but we also can't make the assumption the other way either so either I agree, I agree. Like, my goal is to mix it up not 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 do one thing right. or the other I'm trying to right. mix it up Let's, right but see the issue with mixing up is <clears throat> this is a chronological order situation I, I want to talk about the power and the privilege that the majority has and who created 
the ideology around the fear and the othering of, of, of same gender loving people and trans people were cis hetero people, even if those cis hetero folk were white cis hetero folk who created that rhetoric. Have you ever heard of Roy Cohn? You ever heard of Roy Cohn? No. Okay. Look up people watching. Look for Roy Cohn, who was a colleague of J. Edgar Hoover, who was also a homosexual, by the way. Do your do it right now if you want. Google Roy Cohn. Matter of fact, I think is either one of these. There's there's a um, documentary out on him right now, which is very good. I saw it on the airplane in one of my last trips. But Roy Cohn in the 50s and 60s, and they lived to be in the 70s, was a white homosexual person who was the most monstrous against homosexuals in this country. Mm -hmm. Edgar Hoover, who wore dresses and heels was monstrously against homosexual. Who, 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 he, he, he sponsored raids on bars. He sponsored the attacks and jailing of homosexual people. He was one of the worst ones. Roy Cohn and Jagger Hoover, two homosexual white men. And, and while people were minding their own business, not even thinking about homosexuals, they sat sit in the troops to attack homosexuals, including at, around so-called Stonewall. So it's not it, that's not true about I mean, like that again. What right, would be the exception that I'm talking about? Like, of course, these people were, these people were systemically powerful. These people, Jacob, I Hoover, get like it. I get it. I, he was I able totally to control, determine how society operated on this issue. I I totally get that. But what I'm saying is that, like, because we're conflating a whole lot of things to build upon an argument. For one, there's a lot of yeah. It is because for one, like if we're going to talk about it's, it's just, it's the same way that we make stereotypes about black people being more dangerous than anybody else. Like, no, but, no, no, I, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, I, got, I don't mean to interrupt, but I got, I got, I got, I'm not. I gotta I, say, you don't interrupted me a hundred and one times, I, I am not, but I'm not conflating. You said, okay, well, I can't even explain. I can't okay, even I'm justify sorry. to you why you inflating before I get it. I'll be quiet. <laughs> okay. The. The conflation comes in is we're comparing apples to oranges. Like there's, first of all, and I, I don't know what y'all's ideology is, but for me, there's no one community that is immune to wickedness, to, to, to evil, to wrong. Black people can perform in wicked ways, white people, Asians, gay people, straight people. So you can find mad scientists within every community. But as it comes to the term systemic, I'm sorry, straight people created the narratives that got gays and queers, same gender loving people hiding and living under rocks. They openly participate in being those gatekeepers, which is why this rhetoric exists in nearly every damn church on every fucking street within this country. See, when we talk about, oh, well, it can be said that not all people not all black men are transphobic or homophobic, etc. Well, one of the other issues is we also don't see the outrage by cisgendered hetero black men about the homophobia that is perpetuated within the community. We don't see the outrage by cisgendered black people um, about the transphobic behavior in, in our community. So I'm willing to even scoot up put aside we can't we can't assume all all homophobes and transphobes are straight fine i still want to know where is the fucking outrage from cisgendered hetero black men and black women in this country as it relates to the treatment that their sons and their d daughters their pastors their leaders their politicians okay their pastors their prophets their bibles openly the hurt and the damage that those systems openly do to black queer men and women and transgender folk because i don't see that i don't see that and 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 and, and, and i don't need a passive ass cis hetero man not making it his issue because if you're black and we're all black and and we're all interested in what's best for all of our black folk OK, that means also being inclusive of that of those queer and trans people. Now, I don't know how much y'all look at, but 
I constantly scrimmage through my social media and see the articles where a black trans woman was killed, shot up in the back of an ambulance, some hate crime happened to this one. And the comment sections are littered with hetero privilege, littered with black black men love to harp on any anytime trance this comes up in the media. Black men love to do it, and so do women. What does she do? She shouldn't be deceiving these people. The conversations get so slotted away from the actual murder of this individual as if we're justifying that there's any reason why that level of consequence should have actually been experienced by any person, even if they lied, even if they tricked you, even if she was a biological he and didn't afford you that information, okay? Like, and that religiosity is in the background. Like, as a Black queer man, these things stand out to me because I'm queer. So obviously they're gonna be relevant to me. When this rhetoric comes up, when this anti shit comes up, this is going to be something that I pay attention to. For other people who don't, if you're not trans, you're not effeminate, you're not gay, you're not black, then you know these are things you can mold over. You, you have the luxury because of your privilege to have a simple ass attitude toward things that real LGBT folk are going through out here in this world, me being one of those um, individuals. And when you brought up the whole thing about, yes, there are queer people who are, or same gender loving people, I'm gonna use your term. Are you? They can be anti same gender loving, they can be anti gay. Yeah, yeah, that's the end result of the self hate you've been taught to have towards yourself. That that's understandable. Just like we can talk about, just like we can not excuse, but we can explain or put into perspective domestic violence of black men and a lot of the behavior that black cis hetero men do as it relates to white supremacy. It's all conditioning. But my issue sometimes is me being compassionate towards you doesn't mean that I'm not going to hold your ass accountable. I can understand why you fucked up. Does that excuse your fucked upness? No. And does it mean that I'm not going to hold your ass to stake? Because I know why you fucked up. No, I understand why you killed her ass. You still got to pay up. I understand why you did what you did. I understand why, why you're violent. Violence was done upon you. I understand why you're sexually assaulting other young men and women in your family because you were assaulted at a young age. Does that excuse your behavior? No. I can understand, be compassionate, even offer a glimpse of mercy, but where does the accountability come in at on behalf of the perpetrator? If I'm a queer, if I'm a same gender loving man out in this world, having to be scared everywhere I go, having to police where I am, having to decide, can I get out my car in broad daylight if these niggas on the end of the corner? Can I go into this particular part of town dressed like this? It like, why should I have to live like that and that's not in my mind because the men who do things like that to men who look like me or to trans women look like those men on the end of the corner even if those aren't those men at the end of the corner there's going to be it's it's completely natural and organic for every human being to first and foremost self-preserve I'm going to consider my safety. I don't give a damn if you are my black brother. I don't give a damn if you are my black sister. If violence has been done, has been done predominantly towards me, I'm going to reasonably try to identify these people in my spaces every time they're in my spaces so that I know how, how I need to show up in this space. Or rather, I need not to show up in this space at all because I don't want to risk a deadly encounter, a violent encounter. So I just, it seems like, Dr. Cleo, you're, put, you, you're, you're putting the burden of cleaning up homophobia on same gender loving people. Same gender loving people at large at this point. How? How? When and how? When, when, how? Give me an example. Because, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm about to tell you what I'm talking about. Because like in the conversation you had with, Dr., with Funky Dineva, also in this conversation when we go to speak our experiences, it's well, you know, it can't even, well, those men might not be straight and or, you know, this is due to white, once again, I'm saying I understand that, which is why I still flock around all of those people, even though I put my life on the line every fucking day choosing to get out of my car to go into predominantly spaces. 
I need you to focus, please, because since you're talking about my sentiments and your problem, my sentiments, tell me the sentiment that I had that you're that you're concerned about. That's the that I had. Somebody, that, that, okay, because I want to respond for real to what you're talking about in terms of something I said, whatever that was, that get you that, want, that, yeah. you want me to make that more clear to you, is what you're saying? Well, I understand what you're saying, but some of the stuff you're okay. saying I, I never even spoke to. I'm trying to find out what I said. You mentioned Quentin. Oh, I said, like I, in the Quentin conversation, and even in this conversation, you are saying that you do understand femiophobia, and you've been fighting for same gender loving people across the spectrum, period, whether they mass presenting or femme presenting, and, and I understand that, and I agree to that. But what I'm saying is that also, like, like in the Quentin conversation, and even in this conversation, you say that, but literally when we go to articulate the bullying and when we go to articulate the violence psychologically and physically that's been done to us by other black men, it's almost, it, it feels, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying it feels as if you are asking us to excuse the problem. Think, well, you're you're freezing up. You're, huh? You're, you're freezing up, cause so we. Am I here? You're back. Now you're, now you're here. Am I am I film presenting? Am I here? Is all of my femininity like? Is it coming through the screen clear? You're you're here. We got okay. It. So I'm just saying that it feels like every time we go to articulate our experiences, it seems like we are being berated for remotely feeling like we have a we have a reason to be concerned about our safety as it relates to other black men and women, even if I know where that behavior comes from. I completely understand homophobia. I understand how black people have been conditioned. I understand blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, my my safety is still on the line and it's still my responsibility to protect myself. And there has to be a reasonable judgment that has to happen if that's being done predominantly in my community and if I'm afforded to also be somebody who can exist amongst many communities, but only experience a certain behavior amongst a certain people like Quentin, I also feel that that's not unreasonable. And it's no more unreasonable than the black women who tell their daughters, don't, 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 don't dress in this provocative what way. Have, don't have a damn thing to do with anything that I said. It, it has it has, it has nothing to do with what with anything that I said. Period. It's yeah. it's, a, it's a it's a it's a creative retelling of what I said. The only thing I said it's not a creative retelling. Yes, it is. I I never yeah. said that that you shouldn't feel anything. All I said was, and I'm still saying, and and I said it when I spoke to Quentin, is that you don't know the sexuality of these people. Or attacking but neither you. do you is what I'm saying. You making an assumption, just like you're saying we're making an assumption. No, you don't know okay, what, what, okay, let's be clear. What assumption am, am I, did I just make? I just what I said. You are saying we are making an assumption. All I'm saying is that well, you're making the same, you're making the same assumption. assumption, is what I'm saying. What assumption? Okay, what assumption am I making? Okay, so you're saying I'm that it can't be the assumption I'm making. This is I'm going to tell you, you are saying that it can't be said that these trans, the, the, these homophobes are, are are straight. What I'm saying is that you're making an assumption that that's not an assumption. We can't put that in the category of making an assumption. It's, it's, it's giving everybody a blank slate. We, 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 we can't make assumptions as to the gender identity or sexuality of in, any individual you know, re regardless of how they how they show up in the world. The, the other thing I did want to, to touch on though is, you know, when you mentioned where where's the outrage, you know, from our cisgender community, whether it's, you know, black black men or, or black women, when these when these tragedies or traumas happen within our community, the thing is, again, you 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 can't expect you know, a, a unicorn to pop out of a vacuum. If, if, if you're dealing with a, a community that has been traumatized and that has been brainwashed and, and conditioned to react and, and to treat each other in a particular way, then that outrage is going to be missing, missing until there is, 
you know, that that deconstructing of all of those false narratives that have been that have been imposed upon our community. So, so again, the, the, the only time that you're going to see that is when you have those individuals who have taken it upon themselves to, to deconstruct those narratives, to question the things that have been imposed upon them, to reach across, you know, to have those conversations with individuals within the community that, that don't look as they do. That's when you're going to see, you know, that outrage and individuals who are willing to step up and to speak out. But in general, you know, if, if we're dealing with a society that has been brainwashed into, you know, white supremacy ideology and patriarchy, which is exalting, you know, that that hyper masculinity complex, then you're, you're, you're not going to see that outrage. You're, you're, you're literally asking for a unicorn to come knock on your door. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Like you, yeah, you, you we're, we're all we're, we're all black. But you're validating but you're validating everything that I said. On one end, you cannot argue that black men are fighting for masculinity, fighting for their self-actualization and they're mutating and, and acting out as a result of fighting for the actualization. But then when it comes to the hate crimes committed against black queer people by, by black people, do so much scooting around holding black people accountable now now at the end of the day i'm I, i'm not going to speculate whether whether these men are straight or fucking not because if you are you 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 present this way okay are you the big drug dealer on the end of the corner you got a hundred females on your arm you are the hyper masculine nigga identifying as a crip or a blood with 12 baby mamas i'm not making no assumption about anything you represent that community but even if even if I take away the fact that you still might be some closeted, oppressed, bisexual man, okay, I'm still wondering then, why am I walking through the hallways of school and those so-called good cis cisgendered, cisgendered hetero black men don't have an outrage toward the damage and the bullying done to black trans people and done to Black. That's, that's the whole unicorn thing. Again, you're expecting you're expecting a reaction out of a group that hasn't hasn't fully fully healed from okay. from whatever. Is it though? Have they have they not fully healed or are hetero? Because it just seems like hetero cisgender black men are just healthy and absolved of everything. And what I want to know is like, just where are these men? Like, 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 where are you participating in protecting your community against the big bad monsters and the big bad boogeyman? It, it's in our, it's in our community. They, it's they, no, where, where? They, well, a few of them were on that that panel with with Dr. Cleo and G Smalls. You know, uh, G oh, G's, G's cousin was, you know, very articulate and very, you know, um, you know, advocating for. You know the LGBTQ community, same gender loving community, in, in my community as well. I mean, I'm I'm openly gay. I don't, I don't ever I don't ever hide my sexuality from anyone. And you know, and I live in a predominantly well, it's it's a predominantly black neighborhood. I've I've only seen one white neighbor so far, but you know, they, yeah, and they they come and speak to me, and they you know they they introduce themselves to me. And, okay, but once again. But 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 we're also talking. But see, this is we're talking about we 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 we're talking about sexuality in the community as if it's a vacuum. But we we also talked about a hierarchy system. So yes, your your experience as Kayan does not speak to the truth. Exactly, I get that. that same treatment around the corner or the more effeminate, mm -hmm. pronounced right. RuPaul black same same loving man having that same experience. So right. so no, not one of us can just project our own experience out to the majority because we're not, my point is we're not all having the same experiences. We're not afforded the same treatment based upon a lot of nuance and a lot of details like mass presenting, et cetera. And I also want to say about that panel, that panel was reminiscent of a lot of things that go on within my family where we may talk about the cis hetero people in our life who are accepting, but a lot of times, the people around us, our family members, et cetera, they're making an exception when they accept us. I have plenty of people, plenty of men in my family, black men who accept me. That's as far as the acceptance goes. 
I, I I am the exception to the rule. So a lot of times we get it conflated that just because your mama love you and your brother accepts you, that your bro that same brother who accepts you is accepting every other same gender loving individual or, or other trans persons. And that's not the case. I have seen even my own brother not ever hold my sexuality over my head or my aesthetic over my head and yet will not speak to another outwardly open queer black man because i am the only i am as far as the exception the acceptance goes and that's remnant look if you look at the comment section under funky dineva's video what i'm saying is that clear i'm not the only black same gender loving man having the experience that i'm having quentin represents a large quantity okay of black same gender loving men these this is not happening within our imaginations and while i said i understand why this exists but what i'm saying is where is the accountability going to go i understand my my responsibility i i understand dr cleo is i have to not lump all black men into the same space i have to somehow experience the bullshit while still being a case by case individual so that i don't generalize or unnecessarily stereotype people at large fine now how are we going to address the actual psychological and 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 physical violence done to same gender loving people and trans people by what can be assumed to be reasonably cisgender hetero black men well, I, I'll, I'll say this. <clears throat> One, I, I, I'll say I, I didn't hear Dr. Cleo making assumptions about I anybody. And, I, and, and from, from what I've heard, you know, during the course of this conversation, no, no one's experience has been di diminished or, or in, invalidated. Um, when we talk about accountability, I think it just comes from just education you know educating ourselves and and creating creating a space for for these type of conversations to happen you know um you know whether it's reaching out to those cisgender hetero presenting in, individuals within our community or not i mean you don't you, you know none of us are are you know bound to to carry that torch you know each of us can choose whatever endeavor we want to take on you know and if it, you know and if, it, if that includes you know trying to reach out to individuals within the, the community that present a certain way in order to educate them and you know perhaps expand their horizons on the the multi you know the multiple faces of the community great you know but you know i think it it, it takes educating co communicating reaching out if well, you feel comfortable to do so go ahead dr cleo one things i requested to no avail in the very beginning of this discussion is that we actually listen to each other and i asked uh i asked you to repeat what i said that was problematic, and you never did. I did. No, you didn't. I did. No, you didn't. I did. No, you didn't. The, the, did. the, the, the tangents that you went on had nothing to do with what I said, and your cousin just accurately mentioned that I wasn't doing what you said I was doing. Well, that's Jamal, an interpretation. And Jamal, Jamal, that's, according to Kayan, that's not according to CTV. That's according to Kayan. Let's be clear. Um, Jamal says, if you don't live the experience, I don't think you can comment on it. Um, I have seen nothing has been said in this conversation, particularly by you, that I have not seen with my own eyes, that I have not deflected or defended with my own body and voice in life. So any anything that even implies to the contrary is delusional, number one. Number two, just like I attempted to tell Quentin, um, who made some assumptions about me thinking that his that he was being unreasonable. 
I never said he was, I never once said he was unreasonable because I don't think he's unreasonable. Never said that. I said that there's anti feminine or femophobia people across the spectrum. And I think we should stop blaming people who are just heterosexual for something that's happening across the spectrum. That's what I said. I, I don't I travel across the country before COVID all the time and I'm in black communities all over the country. And I don't and I and I often spend time with same gender loving people as well as the rest of the community in these, in, the, in these different parts of the country. And same gender loving people are not jumping up if defending trans people. Generally, they're not. If you watch, if you watched um, and the, and showing outrage, generally they're not. If you watched um, David Chappelle's um, comedy skit, he talked about, and I don't remember the remember what he said verbatim right now, but he talked about trans people being on the outside of the car, and he talked about the whole LGBT lists and how transgender people are discriminated against. And you may or may not realize that the T was the last thing added to the LGBT spectrum because of discrimination inside of this community against the T. So I'm trying to understand, well, not understand, I already understand it, trying to relay that we're kidding ourselves and being delusional if we're thinking that all these attacks are heterosexual people. And if we keep on trying to dismiss masculine, so-called mass presenting people because they allegedly don't understand and allegedly don't go through anything. These are destructive, delusional perspectives that only create conflict and does not do not help the situation. I never once said and would never say that what feminine people go through is irrelevant and delusional and not true. I know for a fact that's not true. I know for a fact that the things that you reference around what you're going through are absolutely true. What we don't agree is that everybody who's doing it to you is a, is a heterosexual man. I don't even use all that cis stuff. I don't talk like that. But I don't agree that it's just heterosexual people and heterosexual men who are doing all these attacks. I'm saying that the society that we live in, which is very patriarchal and very ma very masculine privileging, including among homosexuals, is a canvas that's creating a femophobic behavioral reaction that goes across sexuality. That's what I'm saying. And J Jamal keeps, I don't know who Jamal's comments are referred to, but I don't know uh, Jamal, could you yeah. clarify who your no comments are directed at? There's no experience that you have spoken of that's not also my experience in terms of what I've been, what I've witnessed, which is why I've been an advocate for feminine men most of my career because it's like I know what they go through. But I'll close with this: what's never on the on the um, roster to talk about, except for the implication of privilege, is what men who look like me go through regardless of the fact that there's all kinds of proof that we're going through a, a few things. And, and, and you, can talk about accountability. you can't be accountable for nothing that you want to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say this, 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 yeah, there seems to be a lot of people who it seems to feel like we, we don't believe or, or think that people should be held accountable. And I don't think that's, that's remotely accurate. And, you yeah. know, nor do I think that's that's been anything that, I think that they're pointing out the fact that it just hasn't been answered. I post a question probably several times in terms of where is the accountability as it relates to the way that the majority uses their power to damage the community, including black men, black women who are hetero, cisgendered, etc. Like those things come all of us like 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 most black. Most black, queer, anything were raised in households with. Because when we're talking about homophobes, the reason why it's easy to assume that the homophobes and transphobes are straight is because a lot of us who were obviously raised in a straight society and straight families also heard the same rhetoric and were othered and even experienced assault from those we love, our relatives, etc. So when these individuals show up in the media, after they've killed, murdered, beat, harassed, whatever the case it was. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a reasonable assumption to assume because 
cis hetero people participate in the rhetoric that others queer people and the prime example of that is the church you 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 don't see the outrage from black cis your mom jiho witness my pops jiho witness we know where these people stand my grandma is a heterosexual woman my aunts and my uncles are heterosexual men okay they were raised to have a certain attitude a certain attitude that never had to be checked because there was a collective agreement in terms of what 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 queer people were well, that part right? i agree with the part i don't agree with is that because they were in the church that they were heterosexual in atlanta one of the biggest anti-homosexual advocates there was who used to have parades that he decided to have down Peachtree Avenue against homosexuality was indeed a homosexual. That's Eddie Long. So that's what we, that's what we disagree completely around what these people are who are doing this crazy stuff. When, based on my own observations and my understanding of mental health, when I first heard about Eddie Long marching down the street on his own, nobody asked him to do it, to have big old signs that it's homosexual. I said to myself, homosexual. Right. First, that's the person that, that came to mind. And when I see these people who can't let up on the topic, who are obsessed with the topic, as I said, much earlier in this conversation, they're involved in violent levels of disassociation because they don't want anybody to know or think or find out about them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I told you about my about my friend who, 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 who's trans. My friend who's trans will tell you the most loud anti-homosexual religious person in the school was him. He was a he was the one he was the most brimstone. What's that fire? Whatever that cliche is, fire and brimstone person on the top of my high school campus talking about people going to hell. It was him because he was trying to be good in God's eyes because he was worried about his homosexuality that he didn't want nothing to do with. So all I'm saying to you is that all these people that you think are all these homosexuals, doing all, I'm excuse me, all these heterosexual so-called fifth people, that's where we disagree. We don't we disagree fully and a lot, but we don't disagree with the fact at all that feminine people are going through torturous, discriminatory treatment. We don't have no we don't have no argument there. But a lot of what well, we do have an argument though, or a potential argument, is that hetero, excuse me, so-called masculine presenting men are just walking around on a field day of, of happy, safe privilege. That's extremely untrue. And, and, and it's that mentality which helps to create division between these subsections of Black people. And we cannot resolve anything if we if there's an oppression contest going on among a fully oppressed community called Black folks. We're not going to ever go, get anywhere if, if people within an oppressed group where people are being murdered just for being Black are trying to out-oppress each other. It ain't, it ain't going to work. Mm -hmm. and, and to the and to the question of accountability, the uh, accountability happens on multiple levels. Any, for me, any individual that you know commits a crime or or imposes harm upon an individual on any level, whether that's physically, mentally, emotionally, all every individual needs to be held accountable for for any harm that they're inflicting upon upon the community. Mm -hmm. And and that accountability, like I said, happens at many levels, whether that's at, you know, the ju judicial level or even if it's at the social level. You know, us us having the, the voice and the, the platforms to to speak out and to call out these individuals when they have assaulted our community, whether the assault is to ourselves, to our, you know, brothers and sisters around us. So I, I don't know what it is specifically that you guys want addressed around the accountability piece, but I think everybody needs to be held accountable, especially when any type of harm has been done. I think that we need to have a conversation, not today because it's been two hours, but I think we should have a conversation that's specifically about account accountability. Accountability has to be a specific focus, the specific agenda of a conversation to unpack how to do it. It's difficult to have a conversation about accountability when, as far as I'm concerned, things are being said or misinterpreted or people are, 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 are emotional because they have a right to how they feel about what the experience is and blah, 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 blah. All those things can interrupt a conversation that's specifically around accountability. And we, we need to have a conversation about that because accountability is all over the place. The people okay. think accountability is everywhere. Like I said, there is not no huge same gender loving or gay identified black 
uh, subpopulation coming together in swerves to help out transgender people. It is not happening. So why you keep on talking about what heterosexual people are not doing? Why you keep talking about that heterosexual people are not um, having any outrage? Who is? Nobody's having outrage about it. And we need to all have outrage about it. Well, I would disagree with that. Uh, by large, there are black same gender loving activists and white activists across the board who are rallying it's against homophobia and transphobia within the it's country. Definitely white people, white the white gay community, and that's a whole other conversation. And white gays, I can mention Adrian Expression, I can mention the Kingarees, or Justin Jada's a slew of black same gender loving people who are pushing their paper and fighting for their community and the visibility and the equality that we're entitled to. I want to speak to the statement that homo because because. What you're basically saying is that, well, let me ask you this. Are you saying that- Thank you for asking me, I appreciate it. And you, <laughs> and you, are you saying that same gender, not same gender, are, that trans and homophobic people, as far as your experience is concerned, are closeted something that you don't necessarily I know, I, I know I, you don't assume that they're straight. I, 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 pretty, I, I think I speak pretty good English, I think. And so let me let, let me reiterate what I actually said and what I actually believe and, and believe it before Geneva show and blah, 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 blah. This is not a, a, a commentary that's based on Quentin or nobody. This is my perspective. What I'm saying is, and I'm going to try to be brief here because it's a lot. First of all, I have to preface my comments with the fact that I acknowledge and am a, and a, a direct witness to the oppression of feminine people. I know, I know what happens. Like I know my name. I know what happens. I've defended to physically fit, defended in my life and time feminine people, males in this instance, who are being attacked. So I know, I know, I know that occurs. So let me preface preface with it so there will be no confusion about that. What I'm saying though, and this is just as clear as I can get, is that I don't assume like you or like Quentin, that all these people doing all this violent stuff are heterosexuals. I don't have that assumption at all. Not, And it's not because of me dreaming or fantasizing. I know for a fact, based on some case studies that I'm directly connected to, that these people were not heterosexual people. It, there's even a famous case, Matthew Shepard. Remember Matthew Shepard? Mm -hmm. yeah. One Matthew, of those cases. Matthew Shepard was not a home, it was not a hate crime. One of the guys who killed him was a former lover of his. So, so there's a whole lot of mythology that occurs because that, that people use for political gain, particularly the white LGBT community. They, do, they use a lot of people, whoever they can find, to push their to push their agenda. But what, but so so I'm not what we disagree in, and what I'm saying is not what you're asking me about. I'm being real clear that I don't I don't assume for a minute that everybody who is attacking trans people, feminine people are are, are are heterosexual. Also. I don't believe there's a slew, and let me finish, because you already contradicted this. I don't believe there's a slew of people who, who are same gender loving who are defending trans people. I think there's a very yeah. recent, I think there's a very recent phenomenon because people have made trans issues part of the the, the the pop culture narrative where people are showing up because it's politically correct to talk about it. But in the community where everybody lives, not on everybody don't live on, on online. And communities where everybody lives, where I live. The, 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 there's not, and I, and I, because of the Black Men's Exchange, which is a national organization who's connected to thousands of people in and outside of the Black Men's Exchange, whenever transgender people comes up to be defended for being, expressing themselves the way they want to, I'm among the few people who initiate the topic. Most people are not talking about trans people in an affirmative way, not unless they have a platform or involved in some political stuff or something like that. And yes, King Guy's show, you did miss it. There's a there's an interview with Barbara Walters and the guys, there's a there's a jailhouse interview between Barbara Walters and the guys who, who went to jail and prison for killing Matthew Shepard. She interviews them. And one of the guys who she interviews says from jail in prison that um, we that Matthew Shepard was killed because of some drug related activity that went bad. And that they were part of his drug drug taking crew, and one of the guys who 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 referred to himself as bisexual was a former lover of Matthew Shepard. And you can find this stuff online. Okay, so uh, I want to respond to the homophobe thing. So I'm not sure if we completely d disagree, 
I am going to stick to. I think it's a reasonable assumption to assume. There, I don't. Think, I don't believe there's anything that's considered a reasonable assumption. I think that's, it's a reasonable assumption based upon circumstantial evidence. Like whether that's our own experience, whether that's how we were raised, whether that's what we see shapes 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 what I'm going to reasonably assume is going to happen in a in any given situation. That's 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 how the brain works. But I wanted to speak to the homophobe situation. What I believe is that. Homo homophobes and transphobes make up two categories of people. The closeted, struggling, non-accepting folk that you allude to in state, Dr. Cleo Monago in UK, and, but also the religious and weird demonic bigots who really take this rhetoric and they really believe in truth and in fact. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, a lot of actual cis hetero people who, according to them, are cis hetero, justify their othering and their bullying because because of the Bible. That's their go-to as a justification. So when I talk about homophobes, when I'm saying that it's a reasonable assumption, because it's not just struggling people in their sexuality who identify this way. There are people who have been raised to really see us, us all as freaks, as an abomination, as I don't want clear around my children. I don't want cane around my children. I don't want conscious around my children. There are people who are literally terrified of you. And for people who are not as outwardly queer as me, but people who are more, uh, I guess, blendable like Kay and, and Cleo, sometimes you don't, you don't get that treatment until people become aware of. You don't know what I get. I'm, you don't know I, what I, I get. I'm, I'm talking, hold on. So, 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 so why don't we just, Dr. Cleo, since you have a rebuttal for every single thing. About me, yeah. Here is, okay, so answer this. Know. Answer this. Have, have you lost anybody, friendship, association? Have you been discriminated against? Have you been unaccepted by anybody anywhere in your course of a lifetime because of your orientation alone? Yes or no? Just yeah. yes or no? Yes. That's my point. My next point is... What point? I'm just asking you a question. <laughs> Ignorant. Yeah. This, I, I'm, discriminated against, I'm discriminated against often because of my sexuality. Okay, so that's that's Often. my point. That's my point. So I don't know what you are. Supposedly I'm not. I mean, there's two points here. It sounds schizophrenic to me. Supposedly I have male masculine privilege. And while you do work, have male masculine true. privilege, sir, but you're still a part of a oppressed group. So they're still within that going. What, like, this is not rocket science, Dr. Cleo Monago. Do you understand that as a as a queer man, right? You, ex you oh, exist. Oh, I'm not a queer man. You Call you, me no as a same gender loving black male, you exist within an oppressed group. Within that oppressed group, still exists privilege. Like that, that's not a that's there's not a, a oppression among feminine gay men. There's oppression. Um, excuse me. Let we me, let know me. that. We know there, that. We there, know that's there, my point. That's my point. I, I miss, well, no, I misspoke. I don't mean what I just said. What I was trying to say was there is privilege along the whole spectrum of people, wherever white people assign it and need it. Your cousin gets to finish saying about how there's a lot of black gay identified men who get powerful positions in the society. That's gay privilege. There's women. Women have more jobs than that's, men, black men. Women that's what I'm saying. So you can be a part of a press group and still possess privilege. I mean, but there's, but there's, yeah, I mean, there's privilege in, in every group. Okay, but I'm right. saying that that's what I'm talking about. So what are we talking about when there's a rebuttal? I'm saying that you can be, you can have both. You can be oppressed and still possess privilege within that community based upon the nuance of masculine, feminine, who's top, who's bottom, whatever mm -hmm. the contrast and comparison is within the community exists. All of that, like all of that shit is, it can exist. I'm not talking in a polarity in extreme left and extreme right. I'm just saying it don't have to be one yes, over the other. They both, they yes, both, what I have said from start, start to bottom is that they both can exist. I talk about this on every single video. I address it and say the same thing and every time this topic comes up. You have both. You just said that women, women are oppressed within a patriarchy and yet there's privilege that exists. Gay men are oppressed within a white patriarchy yet they're still privileged. That's all that I've been saying is that both can exist. And as it relates to Gay on gay rhetoric, like at the end of the day, the reason why same gender loving people are not going to, I don't feel the need to necessarily combat the the hate that comes from other outward 
gay men or trans women is because I'm not killed by those people. I'm not punched and stabbed by those people. I'm not stalked on the way home from Walmart by those people, not those people. Because see, going back earlier to the conversation, I said, I don't give a damn what somebody believes. I'm all about behavior. I'm going to be around those. I don't care what you personally believe. I don't care if you think I'm a queen. That means nothing to me. Am I going to be more terrified by the person who thinks I'm a queen and the person who wants to hunt me down because I'm either a freak or nature or he can't take me showing up because it says something about something he ain't dealing with within himself? Sure the fuck is. And I don't give a damn whether that's white people I got to be around or, or, or more effeminate, same gender loving black men I got to be around because my safety is what I'm concerned about first and foremost. And not just my physical safety, well, my I'm, psychological and emotional safety. Because I'm emotional safety too. And I want you to be safe too. And I want people to not I'm going to be. I want, people not to worse. I want people not to judge you and treat you sideways because of how you present yourself. I want all of that. And I and I I believe in your right to exist and express yourself any kind of way you want to, and I advocate that and I support that, and I have no issue with that. Exactly. Why I do have issues is is the is the universalizing of every of, of people who are discriminating. But I, you know, I've always no, I, I I I completely understand that, and I think that that has to be that has to be a conversation. But I feel like a lot of people are not in a place to have that conversation because there's so many things happening. Well, I don't. So we're not going to go into this, but Dr. Cleo. So where do we begin in even removing whatever homophobes are dealing with within themselves? Like, like if there are people right now watching this who hate gay people, who who are othering same gender loving people, like what what would you say to those people? Well, I'm a strategist. And I deal with things in, in nuance. And I consider nuance. And I ask the question all the time when I meet with brothers and sisters across the country, I'm talking about same gender loving sisters and brothers all the time. I ask them, what has happened on a macro level, which means a large scale, global, or even national level, that would be so powerful that it would teach black people who same gender loving people are? To understand same gender, living. what has happened on a, on a national level, on some kind of macro powerful level that would wake black people up to who same gender loving people are? I've asked that question many times, and it gets to the point because of time here. Nothing, nothing has happened on a macro level. So you have a community that's same gender loving, heterosexual, etc., who it's not. We, you be, you began this conversation with somebody. It might have it might have been your cousin. Who, who did this, it's, who talked about, who initiated the topic about us not knowing our history. In order, you, you can't, it's just, I don't know if you've ever been in love before, but you can't make nobody love you. You can't make nobody respect you. I get a lot of respect where I do get respect because I respect myself and it's real clear. Mm -hmm. Minister Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam asked me to speak at the Me and Man March and because because they wanted the same gender loving person to speak, it's because my self respect is is clear, just like James Baldwin's self respect is clear. So because of my self respect, I have helped to transform lots of people, including same gender loving people, from an anti SGL mindset to a respectful mindset of who they were as same gender loving people and who this heterosexual person was as somebody who was looking and didn't get it. One of the things I said on Quentin's show, because it, it happened, was SGL as a term is not, not only powerful for same gender loving people to get us to talk about loving as a number part of how we reference ourselves and to resurrect the intention to love so we can rehumanize ourselves instead of being tortured and unhappy, but talk about that we can love and we know how to love and love is part of who we are. That's how we reference ourselves. External to that, I told the story about this this elder woman after I did the debate with the Nation of Islam. I love that story, by the way. Well, it's true. After 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 I debated with Nation of Islam, who called the faggots and punks out was meeting in the black community of Inglewood, and, and the sister came up to me and you know you heard the story. She said, "I never heard, I never heard y'all called loving before. You kept saying same gender loving." And I was like, 
that don't fit the perverted perspective I have of you. And you kept saying like was a real word. And I told her all words are made by people. All words began from a person's articulation. So there's no thing as a word that's not real or not real until you, if you, not unless you reject it, but if you accept it, it's real for you. So, I, and she, and she said, as you remember me telling the story that, and she must've been at least 80 and clearly had to cross around her neck. So she was, well, she was Christianized. She said, I never thought about love when I thought about y'all, but now I do. And thank you. She actually, cause she hugged me. So my point to you as part of answering your question is that can't nobody take accountability accountability or even ponder the idea of taking accountability or stepping up in support of something they don't understand, mm -hmm. including same gender loving people who don't understand transgender people. There's a lot of same gender loving people who don't understand transgender people who don't understand that impulse. They don't understand it. So they don't show up in advocacy of it because they don't get it. Exactly. Also, in this community, I'm talking about the SGL trans bike community or subpopulations, it's not a unified community. It's not, it's not a community that has havens created by itself um, or for itself among it. In Atlanta, Georgia, which has more homosexuals than ancient Greece, that city does not have a reliable entity built for the empowerment of single living black people. It doesn't have it because of the internalized woundedness and trauma as your cousin re referenced, that's unresolved and, and loose like a like a water hose, unresolved and, and healed in this community. So we can't expect, and this is the most important part of my point, we can't expect the outside community or other black people to be respectful and get it if we don't take, take, take care of ourselves. I'll close with this to help make my point. When, what's his name, the, 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 the gospel singer, Danny McClurk, McClurk, Donnie McClurkin. When Donnie McClurkin went to that some kind of youth group and starts talking about talking against homosexuals and saying he had changed, I went online and people were saying, she Miss 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 McClurkin needs to shut the fuck up. Miss Clerkin needs to stop laughing. I see you over there laughing. Miss Clerkin is and they were just talking all this stuff about Miss Miss McClurkin. And I said to them, and I was very, very serious, I said, where does a conflicted, same gender loving person go inside the black context for shelter. What you're doing right now is traumatizing. You cannot stop trauma with trauma. You have to deflect trauma. You have to interrupt trauma with another consideration so we can look at loving ourselves and consider having respect for ourselves. We can't get the heterosexual community. Nobody else will respect ourselves until we respect ourselves, which is why I started off this rant with the fact that I get a lot of respect in certain circles where I, I otherwise wouldn't get respect, not because I'm masculine identified, with, which people assume, but because Cleo Monago has self-confidence and, and know who he is, and, 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 and his self-love and self-confidence is not negotiable. I don't walk into a room self-conscious and wonder what people think. I don't give a damn what they think in terms of how they feel about me as a human being. I'm not concerned. And it becomes real clear. When people walk in the door wounded, like I used to tell people all the time, if you quote unquote come out to your parents like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm homosexual, they're gonna treat you like, oh my God. If you come out with, hey, I love myself, this is who I am, I'm just letting you know since you're my parent. That has a whole nother energy than coming out terrified and insecure and self-conscious about what you just said to your family. I know this from having witnesses. I know this from having led same gender loving people into their families with confidence when they when they initially went into them terrified. If you are a same gender loving person, that's who you are. Be who you are, and learn to love that. There's a a, a whole lot of self hate in the black community at large, and show enough in the community of SGLBT. Notice I didn't do LGBT, I don't do that. Notice I said <laughs> in the SGLBT subpopulation, there's a lot of self-hate. And some of this behavior and violence that we're witnessing and experiencing is a consequence of that self-hate. That's So that's what I want people to understand. We have to be good to get good. Completely agree. That's I how you say, I want to say to that point before I let uh, Kayan speak is, um, I I am very empathetic toward 
my folk because nothing about this was supposed to happen. Like this, this could not have happened without me being passionate and willfully surrendering to uh, what I understood to be true about myself. What art, and which is why I keep my my foot on the necks of our people, is because I understand that I'm an exception, and that it takes a lot. Like if you're on your own trying to cultivate self awareness, and you're on your own trying to self actualize without the support of your community, without the support of family, without the support of, of narratives that positively impact your psyche, your emotions, etc. That it's not impossible for you to still get there, but my God, the odds become very interesting when you're left on your own to navigate through a lot of the hurt, a lot of the trauma, a lot of the self-hate that you've learned. And I know that people are going to have to, have to be very self-initiative as it relates to their healing. Like they're just going to have to be. Um, and that at this point, we can't totally look to the outward world to, to set the conditions up in order to get us there, that we're going to have to be extremely proactive personally about our community, our ethnicity, our spirituality, our mind, our psyche, our, our, enti our entire mental health. Um, but I, I am hurt. Well, I mean, I think you brought up a, a really good point. But I, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm not really hurt for me because I got it. Well, I, I think I think uh, the the benefit to this particular live and this this type of conversation is, you know, we're we're all here for the healing and the collective uplifting of, of our community. You know, that's that's the central theme of this conversation. You know, whether we all articulate it the same way and and whether we all navigate it the same it is, you know, as individuals, we will all come to the table table very differently. Um, but but self-healing, you know, it, it, it all starts from within, you know, re reconciling and embracing all of the unique pieces that make you who you are. And once you and once you start to embrace that and, and bring those pieces together and, and, and once you start to fully accept yourself, then you're able to step out into the world, you know, more, more confidently without the dependency on anyone else validating your right to exist. One of the points I think Conscious was trying to make is that they, because of, and, the, and, the, and they show up as a result of self-acceptance. Self so they have some level of, of audacity, boldness, courage, and self-acceptance. But what's painful, and I've cried about this before, before myself, is that he knows that there's legions of people who are, who are wounded, hurt, brutalized, violated, attacked because they choose to do the same thing. And they may or may not have the level of confidence or audacity or courage that he has. And I think it breaks his heart that we're going through this. And I say we because I don't feel like uh, he's any more or less homosexual than me. Right. It has a different has a different veneer. But um, we're going through a lot. And in my work as a behaviorist and a person who does therapy with people, I see pain that would blow your mind all the time. And when I worked at the Los Angeles Youth Network in Los Angeles, I saw pain from a multicultural perspective. My work is fully black now, but when I worked at LAYN in LA, I work with Asians, whites, everybody. And um, when it comes to same gender loving people, um, there's a lot of pain, particularly for people who are not white. And the reason I say that, even though there's people among white folks who are going through losing families, rejection, they have this huge culture called the LGBTQ culture 
that they can go to and be affirmed culturally, spiritually, self-conceptually, eth ethically, eth all kinds of ways, because gay from Paris and Britain, queer, all that stuff is white folk stuff. So it affirms them from the from the from top to bottom. But and, and, and they do and they have such, and they're so powerful, they got people thinking that white people accept them. And that's not true. There's a, there's a, there's still a white led anti-homosexual movement in this country that's still going on, but they don't have the kind of power and press that the white gay community has. And, and it, they don't have no Ellen Janetta, whatever in the Ellen something, equivalents in their crew on television, but, but it still exists. But I, I feel a lot of empathy and I think a lot of direct a, a lot of a direct understanding and experience of the pain that that that, you, that you're showing, but I don't believe that uh, that. And this might bother you, but I'm just going to say it. I don't believe that a heterosexual against homosexual war, particularly given all the nuances and contradictions to that war, because there's homosexuals on the anti-homosexual part of that war too. That's not going to help us. We have to. I, the reason I've had success, some people assume again because of how I present, but they're wrong because James Baldwin was a limp wrist, effeminate homosexual with a lisp. And black people loved him. Now, there were exceptions. But the, the Black Panthers and Malcolm X, who you couldn't get no more blacker than them, loved them from James Baldwin. Wrist broken, um, legs crossed, cigarette, cigarette snatching, all of it, because he was about black people. And unlike Bear Rustin, he didn't say anti-black stuff. He was with black people in freedom fighting. So they were like, come on, bro. And that's how I'm often treated. Because when I spoke to people from the Nation of Islam and Dr. Francis Crest was and other people, when the conversation was over, they said, I didn't know nobody like you existed. And what they meant was, a same gender loving person who wasn't addicted to whiteness. They have seen Lemon and these other people that we listed before. I mean, I don't know if you saw when RuPaul was, was um, after he got his Emmy, he was interviewed and somebody asked him where the people of color. Did, you, did anybody see that and see what happened to his face? Right. He, went, he was catatonic and froze because he ain't about black people. So he did not know how to answer that question. But black people, this is what I want you to understand, Conscious. There are black people who don't get us because we have not given them any information who think you and me and all of us are RuPaul. That's representation they see. So some of the anti-homosexual perspective is based on black people thinking you're not about us. I'm not saying that they're correct in their analysis. I'm telling you what they assume. I have had... I have had some of these black nationalists say to me, <laughs> which is a sign of complete insanity, that you need to make up your mind. Are you with the white gay community or are you with us? I'm like, what kind of question is that? You don't know me very well. Nobody who knows me would even ask a stupid question like that. I don't hang out in the white gay community. But they have such ignorant, linear, assumptive behavior that they're making all these grand assumptions. And they assume that I'm somewhere conflicted about who to support. I'm not conflicted at all. And my life speaks to the lack of conflict. But when you're looking at the world through the blinders of your subjectivity, your pain or your anger, where you can't see the whole, the whole picture, people make assumptions and or act out on each other. And part of the solution, getting to the solution issue, pardon, that's my roommate trying to get into the picture. I don't know if you see her. That's her head. Anyway. <laughs> see, I am a homosexual. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. Anyway, no, I'm just trying to get a laugh. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that we can't fight black people and expect to build unity with black people. It ain't gonna work. You can't go to a community where people are being shot and died, died and killed and called it oppressive and expect them to suddenly get what you're saying when they know what oppression is like too, and you're calling them the oppressive. You can't go to black heterosexual men or alleged heterosexual men and say you're the equivalent of a white supremacist and then expect to build community when they just got killed by the cops. It ain't gonna work. 
My success with black people across the board has been because I speak to black people from a black affirming perspective because I believe in that and it's worked strategically and it's, and it's built bridges because when the conversation is over, there's no doubt that his brother is about, is about his people. And I was wrong, meaning them, to think that he wouldn't be because of his sexuality. Mm -hmm. And when they look on TV, I mean, Don Lemon has a higher profile than me. Sykes has a higher profile than me. Lee Daniels has a higher profile than me. And they see all these anti-black same gender loving people, they think that those are my people. That's why I ask all the time, and I'm going to end my long rant with this, same gender loving black folks, trans black folks, bisexual black folks, what has happened on a macro level in this country that says suddenly give black people a clue about who we are? Nothing has happened. There's more, there's more white gay rhetoric than there's black SGL rhetoric because they got the power. And they got the unity. When we get some unity, we're gonna be a, we're gonna be a force. When we when we start having cultural cohesion as black people, including black people who got little drops of white like you, who identify as black, when we start becoming united with black people and stop creating new conflicts and new trauma, it's gonna be on. Won't nobody be to mess with us as a people. But right now they can have a field day because we're so conflicted over stuff. And we don't know our history. If we knew our history, we would be real different. If we knew about Kabaka Mwanga and the twins that were that were that were the royal families, makeup artists in the fifth dynasty of Kemet, and all these other people I know about that we don't know about, like what we know about Ellen DeGeneres, we knew our history, we'd be we would be first of all inspired because we would realize that our people affirmed us. But we don't know that now. We look at our people as, as trying to kill us. You all right over there? What's wrong? Yeah, talk talk to a conscious. How you feel? Do you feel that any part of, of your existence has been invalidated in this conversation? I hope not. What is going on? I, mean, I want to understand if I can, what you, what's hurting you? Not because I don't think you have the right to be hurt. I think you do have the right to be hurt, but I don't know what's hurting you. Exactly, yeah. It's just a it's just a floodgate of emotion, just just a purging and a releasing. I guess. I mean, that's okay. I mean, that that happens sometimes, and you know, it's perfectly fine and it's perfectly normal. You know. So you know, in a, in a space like this, is you know, we we've we talked about a lot of things, and and we've talked about a lot of issues, especially as it relates to our community co collectively. Speaking of the, the black community, and then also speaking on the, the sub levels within the, you know, whether we call it same gender loving <laughs> Q community or LGBTQ, you know, however anyone chooses to identify. But in the midst of that, you know, there, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of hurt and there is a lot, you know, to unpack because, you know, we, we occupy a particular community that has been systemically um, hurt and under attack for centuries now. You know, so it, 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 we're, we're in a, a very pivotal space where you know, a lot of self-care is needed, you know, whether we're talking about emotional self-care, spiritual self-care, physical self-care, all of that is important as we, you know, navigate this space and as we continue in our journey and first building up ourselves. Because you can, you can the, the only way that any of us can ever be effective within the community is, is once we show up as whole people ourselves. You can't, yeah. you can't go up, you can't go out 
<laughs> you know, as a broken individual hoping to to heal a broken community. <laughs> you 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 have to you have to reconcile and bring together all the pieces of yourself first and and and, and find you know find truth and strength in in self first before we can ever be effective within the broader community. You know, so at, at the end of the day, it, it, it all starts. It all starts at home first before we can ever be effective in, in hoping to bridge the gaps with with anyone. You know, uh, across the spectrum. Self respect inspires respect, but there's a terminology that Purple Lover um, is using, which I think is very powerful and relevant. They are saying that they use the term trauma bonding. And if we bonded around the healing of our trauma, again, we would be, it would be difficult to stop us. Right, yeah. And we're not doing that. Unfortunately, a lot of us are re-traumatizing each other, re and and, and and putting a hierarchy on that trauma. <laughs> you know, well, my trauma is greater than yours because I, I experienced this and you don't experience this. You know those kind of things, but again, understanding that you know collectively we 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 all experience trauma, and through and and through that collective trauma, we can come together as a collective community to help in facilitating you know healing and greater understanding about the different faces of of the black community. You know, as I, I think a gentleman had mentioned in one of the previous videos, you know, the black community isn't a monolith. You know, we we all have different faces. We all show up very differently and helping to facilitate those conversations that help to bridge that gap. And, you know, just because I show up a particular way and you show up a particular way, it, it, it doesn't diminish anybody's value, nor does it exalt anyone's value. We're, we're all equals here. We all have equal right to exist. We're all perfect particles of creation. You know, there, there, there are no mistakes. There were no mistakes. Um, you know, and and just you know, continuing to to build and uplift our community from there. One thing, one thing that some that has to happen, conscious is you you, you um, get. I think it's important to have some clarity about what, what what's hurting you. Not necessarily talking about it online right now, but you said you didn't know, and I think it's important to sort of, sort of and, and and know that because unresolved pain can interfere with your capacity to be fully present, to be healthy, and to be as, as constructive as I think you would like. You got to understand where it's coming from, and what it's what it's about, if, if, at least for yourself. Um, where it's coming from is as I listen to this conversation and we talk about self-actualization and healing and the work we need to do, I just started thinking about all of we committed suicide as a result of not being able to do that. I think about a lot of the same gender loving black minds who minds who out. Oh, we're losing a little bit of the, the message because you're, you're, you're frozen. You're frozen. But in, in your frozenness, I think you're talking about you, you're, you're empathizing with the, the individuals who, who, who don't have the voice currently to to self act to show up and to self actualize, um, and you know you're empathizing and, and and feeling the pain for the individuals who. That's kind, of what, that's kind of what I said earlier in terms of what I thought was was bothering them. Yeah, yeah because I look at. You're frozen again, so whatever you're saying, we won't be able to hear it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate because we, we we made it to here. Am mm -hmm. I still am I still frozen? I'm still. Well, frozen. You, whatever I'm you said, I, I didn't hear most of it because it was 
it was yeah, yeah so you just am i in. am i still from like am I, you're going in and out I, i'm gonna i'm gonna go in and come back and go how about now now you're fine you're here. yeah yeah, no, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's 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 just the empathy. I just started having flashbacks of uh, my friends who committed suicide as a result of not being able to heal, not having access, to resources, not having the support, the awareness, or even being made, not even understanding that they had a right to to self love because they were under the impression in one way or another that what they were trying to love wasn't supposed to be love, which is themselves. And just thinking about all of my friends who out of that self love turned to a life of promiscuity and got AIDS and died of AIDS, like the way that black same gender loving men self harm is so extreme. Yeah. 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 And, and again, it, it, it's just a it's a it's a space of a, a lot of hurt, you know, um, and that hurt manifests itself very differently for for, for everyone. I, I did also just want to mention just briefly, you know, I am an, an openly gay, HIV positive individual, and I do want to make sure that you know when when we talk about you know, HIV or, or AIDS, it, it, it doesn't have to be, nor does it need to be associated with promiscuity. You know, so I do want to make sure that we, we, you know, we are clear on that as well, because again, we sometimes have an unconscious tendency to stigmatize certain segments of the community or to, or to um, associate certain behaviors with certain outcomes. So, you know, regardless of how their pain manifested themselves and they ended up being, you know, HIV positive or, or with AIDS, it, you know, pe people who've had sex one time contracted AIDS and they're, you know, just, just as individuals who have slept with a hundred people have contracted it. It, it, it has nothing to do with, with promiscuity. However, you know, pain will lead individuals to participate and engage in unhealthy activity. I think that's, you know, that's, that's the main point here. Um, and it's, it's, it's an unfortunate reality, you know, hurt people, hurt people. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's the whole cyclical effect of, of pain and trauma. It, it's, it's a cycle. It continues to be passed on from one generation to the next. Hurt people, hurt people, which is a true fact and cliche is way more said than hurt people can help people. Mm -hmm. Hurt people can use their hurt as information to, to inform what to not let happen anymore. Uh, hurt people can also use their, that they are hurt or they witness the pain to, to activate, to become an activist, to fight against the sources of that pain. Because though I'm a confident person and blah, 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 don't get me started on the pain I feel. Right. Yeah. Um, on every topic that we talk about, including losing the love of my life to HIV, which I've yet to stop mourning. So pain can also be, if you allow yourself to be a decent human being and not let your pain run your life and make you vicious, but look at the pain as, as proof that you have a heart, which is a good thing that you have a heart. And let that be, that being your heart, what guides you, that pain can become constructive. And it could be very rewarding to do work inspired by the desire to heal that has impact. I mean, even that conversation with Deneva, Quentin, and with G Smalls, I've had over a thousand people, new followers. And I'm getting, and I'm constantly getting, even this morning, sisters and brothers who were transformed by that conversation based on my sentiments. And one of the things they kept talking about was SGL, and how they really appreciated 
the love, the loving part, and how gay and lesbian, et cetera, though they found sanctuary and sexual acceptance because society says that's what you're supposed to call yourself in those terms, they didn't necessarily invoke love in their considerations. And they wanted to do what they did from a black perspective, which is what SGL provides. But um, yeah, the, the response, including there's some even some trans, some trans, male female trans people who felt who resonated with what I was saying and wanted to be my friend now online and blah 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 blah. So all that to say in terms of what originated that comment was that hurt. I'm not immune to it. And it can also be information. You know, some people become parents because they don't want to be like their abusive parents. And they want to do give their give some children who are born to the planet another experience. So hurt can help people too. Right. Absolutely. I love that hurt people can help people. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, I know we've been here for almost going on three hours now. Um, I didn't even get to the rest of my damn docket as a result of being a woman for the last remaining 35 minutes. Uh -oh. That's all right. That's, that's powerful. We, we um, honor the sacred feminine here. Well, the sacred feminine and Frank, I gotta say this: it's human. It's what we are. Right. And white white folks have made us make a division between masculine and feminine. We're all all of that. Well, we're all all things, correct? I'm feminine. I'm masculine. I welcome and and celebrate all of them exactly. in in one body. And you crying and, and and feeling how you feel ain't ain't being a woman. You're being a human being who is expressing that component of who you are. You know, you're not a woman because you're crying. <laughs> I, was, I was being facetious. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Um, I really, I knew going into this conversation that was going, it was going to be intense. It was going. A matter of fact, while I'm here, let me let me address let me address the ignorant ignorant in the in the comment section in terms of a uh, copy of Funky Dineva. First of all, excuse me, I interviewed. Uh, Dr. Cleo Monago almost three years ago. So if it's going to be said that anybody pop locked and copy off anybody, it can be said that, that funky Dineva did, okay? Miss me with the bull crap. Secondly, <laughs> I find it so fascinating that you guys talk about how healthy these conversations are, but you want them to be held on one platform by one content creator. I think that just like we do the bullshit, we need to be just as infectious of, of the substance that comes from these dialogues. And if every content creator wants to have this conversation and wants to book Cleo Monago, that should be what we want to see instead of it being seen once out of the year on a Funky Dineva special. So right. find yourselves, dismiss yourselves. Are there any, are there any, I, I, I'm gonna have to like, y'all got my emote. I'm too emotional right now, but I gotta I gotta get into a spa or something. I really enjoyed this conversation. I would like for you guys to return. But like to go back after with this conversation and then take it take it somewhere else in the second round. Exactly. We could use this forum as a form of healing. A, you know, a black affirming space for 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 all of us and and our collective community you know, beyond this, you know, beyond this particular medium. Yeah, yeah. So are, are you guys now for a part two at some point? Oh, uh, sure. And I suggest, as I said before, that there is a conversation that's specifically about accountability. Yeah, specific, okay. I'm okay, gonna write that down as a run. Yeah. I'm gonna write that down as a running theme for the second, for the second round is accountability. So. Okay. I Uh, you're freezing again yeah so we're not we're not hearing anything over here see you were you were talking about dr cleo's internet you need to you need to step up your yeah, internet the, <laughs> let me bring it up old stuff let me My internet is fine, My internet is fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> we 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 got supreme internet service apparently. <laughs> Am I here now? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Okay. Now I'm gonna get you guys to give kind of your last uh remaining remarks. I'll start with you, Kay. And can you tell the people where they can find you? And et cetera. <laughs> well, currently they they can't find me anywhere because I've been on a social media hiatus since April of this year, just doing my own self-care and spiritual cleanse. However, you know, generally once I am, you know, if I so choose to reoccupy that space, I, I'm under KNR Kari on Instagram. And then I, I have a YouTube channel called Naked Spirituality. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on my own cleansing journey and self-care and self-help. So right now I'm in a vacuum. Okay. Okay. Well, you guys heard it first. Uh, what would you want people to take away from the topic uh, today? Oh, just that we're we're all here for the same purpose. We're we're all here for the upliftment and the embitterment of the black community. No one of us will have you know the the right you know the the right way to do everything. Everybody resonates with with each person differently. Your approach will, will resonate with certain individuals. My, my approach will, in, will resonate with certain individuals and the same thing with Dr. Cleo. But at the end of the day, we're, we're all here for the, the collective betterment of the community. So I, I hope at the very least, even with the, you know, the, the different levels of articulation in our experiences, that everyone who joined in the conversation at least got that energy from, from those of us here on the panel. Yeah, well, that's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Dr. Cleo Monago, what are your remaining statements? And please tell the people where they can definitely find your services since you do healing and counseling work, et cetera. That is necessary information. Okay, well, um, I run the Amasi Center, and Amasi spelled Apple, Mary, Apple, Sam, Sam, I, A M A S S I dot org. And that website pretty much embodies the elements and nuances of what I bring to the world through that center and through other work. I also am the chief advisor for the Black Men's Exchange. And you can see our work at bmxnational.org. And uh, I can be found on Facebook at my name, Cleo Monago, on Instagram at Cleo Monago, and on Twitter at Cleo.Monago. And I welcome engaging people as I can. Um, on, on these issues. Um, in terms of a closing comment, I believe that I said earlier, and I'm going to re repeat it, that if we want our community to get respect, we have to respect ourselves. We can't expect people to advocate for us if they see us in conflict. Um, it's difficult to respect the community if it's dealing with internal disrespect of itself. And uh, we have to learn to not have a vicious reaction to things we disagree with, but have a constructive reaction. And particularly between black people, do what I call trauma deflection. Don't re-traumatize people with name calling and all that stuff when they, when they disappoint you. Um, contradict negative behavior with a, with a positive response, which does not mean not making people responsible and taking being accountable for what they do. It's, my whole life is full of making people accountable, but I also make sure that when I walk in the room, I am an asset, not a problem. Mm -hmm. I make sure that when I go places as a black man whose work is around healing and social change, that I have to embody that possibility by how I, how I behave and how I operate. So I don't put down black people publicly. And if I, if I have a problem with somebody, I'll tell them or I just you know, do something else, but I don't believe in defacing other black people. I think that we should change our behavior if we do that because if we want things to be better, we have to be better. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna close by being redundant by saying that nothing has nothing has occurred from this community of same gender loving by and trans people that has informed been that has powerfully informed the rest of the community to get them to have a shift in terms of how they see us. And it's impossible to expect the people to have a shift with no evidence of our re respect for ourselves being demonstrative. 
as I said, the people that are the most known among us in the press are not loving us at home. And that creates a message. If everybody's doing that, it would be different if only one, but all of them are imp implying, like the rest of us in the press, in terms of black people, heterosexual included, that loving somebody black is problematic and not necessarily a good choice. That's what the media imp implies, particularly these days. It creates conflict in the black community. We have to understand how to decode the negative messages about being black in this society so we won't internalize them and learn to love ourselves in our own image yeah. and learn our history. Yeah, absolutely. And before I let you guys go, I know that Kayen had, um, he's kind of mentioned um, and insinuated his spirituality throughout the conversation. Dr. Cleo, do you have a spirituality? Like, what is your concept of God? What is like your Boy, that, is, that is a whole yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can have into segments. We can we can have a whole show on spirituality as well. Not spirituality. But I'll answer the question briefly. I'll say that I am a spiritual person. Um, I am definitely someone who strongly believes in spiritual in the spiritual realm. And I believe that we all have access to that realm. But the more wounded and traumatized we are, the difficult, the more difficult it is to tap into it. You ever remember, see, you probably you're probably all too young to remember when people had TV antennas, because everything is digital. Yeah. And back in the day, if your antenna was bent and you replaced it with a hanger, your reception wasn't that good because you didn't have you didn't have a pristine antenna. Our bodies are antenna to the spiritual realm. And if, our, if we're traumatized and bent in, in some kind of way in our spirit, we don't get the full spiritual access that we could have otherwise. That's part of my perspective. It goes more than mm -hmm. that. I want to give you a brief perspective. I definitely believe in spirituality and we are spirit. Oh, well, I would I would love to definitely have a whole conversation dialogue about spirituality for sure with you and Kayan. So yeah, that would be a remind me. I do I do do you know meditation and spiritual therapy sessions. So you know. Okay. So <laughs> after you hang up here, can you just send me the information and I'll post that's all what I'm going to do. Kane's information in the description box, you guys. Yep, I'll send that to you. Okay. For sure. Well, the melanin is sweating off of Dr. Cleo's face underneath them bright ass Aurora lights, so we're gonna let him go. I want to thank you guys for coming. This was a very unexpected, interesting show, might I add. My goal will be to make one of you cry. <laughs> part, two, part three. And um, call it even. So thank you. thank you guys so much. I'm gonna let you guys go. I'm gonna give my my own closing remarks and then close the show out. But I wanna thank you guys for showing up. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Love you guys. Love you back. Well, there you guys have it. Very interesting, informative, and emotional show. Um, these conversations have to happen. These conversations are necessary. And um, I want to have them all here, you know. And I encourage you guys who saw these, who saw this conversation in part happen on Funky Dineva's platform to go to all of your favorite content creators. Keep the pressure on the people who are influencing you, entertaining you to also show up with a full course meal for you. Uh, suggest, encourage content creators that you love to have relevant conversation and dialogue because we're literally in a critical awakening right now. We need to unpack ourselves down to the bone to get to that self-actualization and that love and that healing that you know the three of us all talked about. I'm so glad you guys enjoyed this conversation and um, yeah, I've lost a lot of friends as it relates to a lack of not having that self-love. That's why every day I wake up, I thank God for what was put inside of me. Cause I, I don't know how I got here. I don't know what, what gave me the courage to show up how I am and to love myself despite a unloving system. Um, but I did, but I also know that 
that makes me unique because every human being is not waking up every day and loving themselves and have the heart and the balls and the courage to love who they are beyond all odds. So my goal as a healer myself is to infect my agenda, my gay agenda at that, my same gender loving agenda, okay, is to help all black and brown people of all hues, of all orientations, of all gender identities to come to a place of personal completion because that may be all that you have. That may be all that you have, okay? When the family don't want you, when the church doesn't want you, when 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 white people, when when other ethnic groups are disregarding us, the pressure is on for us to love ourselves. That's what's going to get us through the night, get us through the day, get us through the era, get us through the decade, get us to the finish line. It is imperative that we wake up and we heal from within, okay? So shout out to Funky Dineva. I love that he even brought this conversation from G's platform, which I'll leave the link to G's platform where this originally started at um, and brought it over to his larger platform for you know a larger conversation. I definitely have all the Clio and Cayenne's um, information in the description bar. Give me about 10 minutes and I will have everybody's information listed in the description. Um, I'm going to let you guys know, let you guys go. I'm going to go and decompose, okay? I love you all, and stay safe.